Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 22nd meeting in 2019. Could I ask you please to all ensure that your mobile phones are on silent? Um, the first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking items four and five in private. Items four and five are discussions on the committee's pre-budget approach and our future work programme. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we'll move on. Agenda item two, and that is European w Union Withdrawal Act 2018. We have received consent notifications in relation to three UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. These instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Are there any comments? Stuart. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, in relation to the common organisational markets and agricultural products market, etc., uh, the motion that's before us, uh, that's part of the uh, general common organisational markets amendments that have been. One of the previous ones that we've already dealt with and agreed as a parliament is the Agriculture Legislative Functions EU Exit No. 2 Regulations 2019 AGTF Oblique 02. And in relation to that, that creates a financial obligation on devolved administrations uh, to provide compensation uh, to certain uh, peoples. And the briefing notes uh, tell us, as they has pre have, have previously done, uh, that UK government DEFRA officials say that the UK will cover that money. Um, but we haven't heard formally uh, that that is going to be the case, and as this is a, a, a cost uh, that potentially devolved administrations, including ourselves, could bear, I, I just want to put on the record that I, I, I think it's time we did here formally. I'm not asking for any action, convener. I just wanted to put it on the record. Okay, well, it's certainly on the record. It might be appropriate that the committee consider writing to receive confirmation that that's the case. Um, do the committee have a view on that? There's sort of some nods and some. So I, I think um, I think what I'd ask is: Is the committee happy to write to the Scottish government to confirm its content uh, for the consent to the UK SIs referred to in the notification, and write to them regarding the uh, the financial position? We're agreed. Okay, and we we'll move on to agenda item three, which is the Transport Scotland Bill. Today we are con continuing our consideration of stage two amendments to the Transport Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity and his supporting officials. I'd also like to welcome the non-committee members present. Um, and I also ought to note that uh, Christine Graham is, is uh, standing in for Richard Lyle, who uh, is away today. Now, I'd briefly like to explain the... Excuse me, I don't think I've been here as a substitute before, have I? Uh, you have, indeed. I have. Well, that's yes. all right. I don't have to make any about declarable interest. No, no, no. In, Thank in, you. Indeed, we remember you, if, even if you don't remember <laughs> us. I'll take that the way it was intended. <laughs> um, you, you can make a declaration if you want to make a declaration. OK. So, I'd... Uh, Thank you. Um, I'd like to explain the procedure briefly before anyone watching. There will be one debate on each group of amendments, and I'll call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and speak to all the other amendments in the group. I'll then call other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group who wish to speak should just catch my attention. Um, if he has not spoken already on the group, I will then invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting members, the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the agreement of the other members to do so. If any member of the, uh, present objects, the committee immediately moves to vote on that amendment. If any member does not move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Please note that any other member present may, may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the Marshall list. Only committee members will be allowed to vote. Votings 
in any division is by a show of hands, and it is important that members raise their hands clearly in the air so the clerk has, can record the vote. Um, the committee is also required to formally indicate that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, so I'll put a question on each section at the appropriate moment. So, we will move on to the bill and to the uh, 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 first section, which is the recovery of unpaid parking charges. And I'd like to call Amendment 260 in the name of Murdo Fraser, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Murdo Fraser, can you please move amendment, two, amendment 260 and speak to all the amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, this is a package of amendments which introduce the concept of keeper liability in relation to charges for parking on private land. Now, I appreciate this is quite a legally complex area, and it's also an area where the committee has not previously taken evidence. And accordingly, if you'll bear with me, I want to set out some of the background to this issue and put these amendments in context. I have a long-term interest in trying to improve the regulation of private car parking in Scotland. This is driven by my constituency mailbag, in that I've been contacted by hundreds of constituents who have been hit with what they believe are unfair uh, penalty charges from unscrupulous private car park uh, companies. Many of these originated at one particular car park in the centre of Perth, but since I've raised the issue, I've been contacted by people right across Scotland who have faced similar difficulties. I've ha and I've had experience, as I'm sure other members have, uh, of uh, people coming to me with penalty notices not being fairly issued, perhaps being issued where people have simply overstayed their parking by five minutes or less, where they've been issued uh, where someone has correctly paid for their parking but inadvertently entered the wrong digit into a parking pay machine, or where the system for paying has been unduly complex and confusing. In some cases, the penalty charges have been extortionate, a basic charge of £60 or £80 rising to £160 in some cases. Often these charges are then passed on to debt collectors and individuals are bombarded with threatening letters which indicate that court proceedings will be taken if they don't pay up. For many people, particularly the vulnerable or elderly, the whole situation can be very distressing and they end up paying these charges even though they might not be properly due. My research on the issue led me to understand that there is no specific legislation in Scotland dealing with the regulation of parking on private land. This is covered at present by the general law of contract. This is a situation where Scotland has fallen behind other parts of the UK. The Protection of Freedoms Act 2012 governs the situation in England and Wales, and this introduced an independent appeal system known as POPLA, Parking on Private Land Appeals. So those who are hit with a penalty charge there have recourse to an independent appeal system. This has never applied in Scotland. And we have a situation here where a penalty notice can only be challenged by going to the same company which issued it in the first place, which is clearly a very unsatisfactory situation. And in addition to introducing an independent appeal system, the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012 introduced keeper liability in England as part of a balanced package of reform. My interest in the subject led me to introduce in December 2017 a Members' Bill proposal for regulation of privately operated car parking in Scotland. And I proposed that this would cover five issues which I believe were necessary for reform. Firstly, legislating for a maximum charge that could be recovered as a penalty for breaching the rules of parking on private land. Secondly, introducing regulation for uniform signage to avoid the present confusing situation. Thirdly, regulation for appearance of penalty charge notices to make it clear that these are civil payments and to differentiate them from local authority issued parking tickets. Fourthly, the introduction of an independent appeal system in Scotland, so we mirror the situation in England and Wales. And fifthly, the introduction of keeper liability in Scotland. I ran a consultation on that proposal. I received 136 responses, including from industry groups, consumer rights organisations and the general public. And there was overwhelming support in principle for better regulation, with 93% of those responding supporting this and only 4% opposed. I subsequently had very positive engagement with the former Transport Minister uh, Hamza Youssef and the current Cabinet Secretary uh, Michael Matheson around these issues, and the Scottish Government has always accepted the need for reform in this area. Whilst I was carrying on with this work, uh, Sir Greg Knight MP, who's a Westminster uh, MP, introduced a private member's bill, the Parking Code of Practice Bill. This had cross-party and government support at Westminster and is now the Parking Code of Practice Act 2019. 
And what Sir Greg's bill does is introduce a statutory code of practice for car park operators for the first time, one that will be rigorously policed. It will tie compliance with a statutory code of practice to access to DVLA records. At present, a car parking company can only pursue car owners if they can identify who they are. And in order to do that, they have to have access to the DVALA database. <coughs> and in the past, DVLA were happy to essentially sell this information to anyone with a genuine interest. But in future, only companies which comply with a statutory code of practice will be able to have access to these records. Without that, their penalty notices will effectively be unenforceable. Last year, this Parliament passed a legislative consent memorandum that would ensure that the 2019 Act applies to Scotland as well as south of the border. And this would therefore deal with the first four points I consulted on, and it will bring in an independent appeal system in Scotland and address the other issues. And that only leaves the issue of keeper liability outstanding, and this needed to be legislated for separately. Having discussed the matter with the Scottish Government, uh, we agreed that the Transport Bill would be an appropriate legislative vehicle in order to try and bring in these reforms. So having set out the background, Convener, let me turn to the uh, amendments. <coughs> what Keeper Liability will do is make the registered keeper of a vehicle liable in the first instance for payment of reasonable penalty charges for parking on private land. At present, under the general law of contract, it is the driver of a vehicle who is deemed liable for any charges when parking on private land. It is the driver of the car who enters into a contract with a landowner or the car park operator. This leads to an obvious difficulty with enforcement, as the landowner or the car park operator has to try and prove who the driver of the vehicle was, which in practice can be extremely difficult. What keeper liability does is allow penalty charges to be pursued against the registered keeper in the first instance, or the registered keeper can identify who the driver was to avoid liability, and the driver can then be pursued against. Keeper liability already exists as a concept in Scots law. It exists for those who park on public land. So anyone who parks on a public street and receives a parking ticket will find it addressed to the registered keeper. It also exists in relation to, for example, the likes of speeding offences, where someone caught by a fixed speeding camera, camera will find a notice addressed to the registered keeper, and if they were not the driver of the vehicle at the time, they can then pass responsibility on to that person, and this issue has, of course, been at the heart of some very high-profile court cases in recent times. So why should we support keeper liability in this context today? Well, it's very important that this is viewed in the context of the other wider reforms I've been describing. This is part of a package of law reform, one intended to bring in a fair balance between the rights of the car driver and the legitimate rights of a landowner or a car park company to recover costs for breach of contract. I understand from the Scottish Government, and no doubt the Cabinet Secretary can confirm this in due course, that the intention is that the introduction of keeper liability will be tied to the date of introduction of the new statutory code of practice, which deals with the other issues of concern that I identified earlier. I would certainly not be supporting keeper liability as a standalone measure, but it needs to be seen in this wider uh, context. In the consultation I ran as part of my Members' Bill proposal, 35% of those who responded were in favour of keeper liability, with 33% who were opposed, 15% who were neutral, and 16% who were unsure. I think that the high percentage of those neutral or unsure reflects that it is quite a difficult concept to understand. Nevertheless, there was a small majority more in favour than against. At present, only around 25% of penalty charges for parking on private land in Scotland are being paid. There is a high level of uncertainty around where the law stands, and there are urban myths that these charges are not enforceable in law, which is not true, and that level of uncertainty is not good for anyone. Bodies like Citizens Advice Scotland have done excellent campaigning work in this area, and everyone has agreed that we need greater certainty. This is, of course, not just an issue for commercial car parks. There are many businesses and private individuals who have a legitimate interest in trying to protect their car parking spaces. Owners of flats in city centre developments, for example, with allocated parking spaces, at present find it effectively impossible in a practical sense to enforce their rights over their parking spaces without keeper liability. So what they find is that their parking spaces are filled up by random members of the public 
coming in to get free parking rather than paying for it, and people who've paid for a parking space can't actually use them. And the same things might apply to, for example, a shop with allocated customer car parking or a business that has parking attached for its staff. What Keeper Liability does is ensure that these rights uh, that already exist in law are much more easily enforced. Convener, I'd like to thank the Scottish Government for all their support in drafting of these amendments and for their cooperation. I'm happy to move Amendment 260. Now, just before I close, can I turn briefly to the amendments uh, 268A and 319 in the name of Pauline McNeill, uh, which seek to amend my own amendments. As far as I can determine, what these amendments seek to do is ensure that any enforcement of these notices can only be done by a public body. And I really cannot see how such arrangement would work in practice. The enforcement of notices for parking on private land is a civil matter between the landowner or their agents on the one hand and the driver or keeper of the vehicle on the other. There is no locus for any public body to become involved and no public body has an interest in the enforcement of these notices. Moreover, I cannot see what public body or bodies is going to get involved in trying to resolve these matters. The Scottish Government has no interest in spending taxpayers' money getting involved in resolving disputes uh, between commercial companies and private individuals, nor have local authorities any interest in getting involved. There are simply no public bodies or agencies that have the capacity to take on this work. So I fear that these amendments, although they may be well-intentioned, are, are essentially wrecking amendments which drive a coach and horses through the carefully balanced package of reform that I've been trying to take forward with the help of the Scottish Government, and I would urge Polly McNeill, therefore, to withdraw these. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madde. Uh, Polly McNeill, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 268A and other amendments in the group? Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, speaking to Amendment 26A, this amendment ensures that only someone employed by a public body can either ensure a parking enforcement notice and ensures that private companies cannot be contracted by local authorities to issue parking enforcement notices. This amendment will prevent the situation where private companies issue tickets with no authority to do so. Um, convener, this is a probing amendment. It's a probing amendment really which is set against uh, Murdo Fraser's amendments and I want to set out why they give me cause for concern. Uh, firstly, um, thank Murdo Fraser for a very thorough explanation, but it's the first time I've heard the reasoning behind it. Um, as you'll be only too familiar at the stage two proceedings of this parliament, there's no requirement to submit a notice alongside your amendment, so you can only read the amendments and try and understand what the member is trying to achieve. Uh, it gives me cause for concern that I think that these amendments would give wide-ranging powers that have not been tested. My constituents in Glasgow have had no say what I think are quite sweeping uh, powers going to be given to private companies. So the amendments introduce new keeper liabilities and uh, apparently that's because Scotland has fallen behind England. I want to set out why that phrase is... Uh, well, I, I think should be examined because in many cases Scotland does things differently. Wheel clamping, for example, has not been legal in Scotland, where in England it's taken them some time to legislate. So falling behind England in these matters doesn't give me cause for concern. As Murdo Fraser rightly says, and this is where I, I do agree with him wholeheartedly, the private car parking industry has been notorious at hitting drivers with record-breaking tickets. In the first quarter of 2018, um, one million and a half sets of vehicle records from DVLA were applied for. As Murdo Fraser says, this is advice uh, uh, noted in 2015 that the highest number of hits they had on their webpage was in relation to this. Um, they say that parking notices are issued every five seconds and the DVLA is in course to share 6.5 million records with private firms. So the first thing I'd ask the committee uh, is to consider um, whether they'd be satisfied that a code of conduct would be enough in order to bring what has been uh, an industry which has, for the some part, um, had a poor reputation amongst their constituents. Uh, murder phrases says that only 20% of fines are paid. Um, perhaps that's because people um, feel that they're being <coughs> unfairly fined, and that's been my uh, experience with the constituents. Um, car parks are owned by a variety of different companies, such as pension funds, finance companies. Town centres is probably the one that certainly I know best where uh, 
town centre sell off the right to car parks. Many supermarkets have done it. Uh, many of the cases that I get are from people who have just parked in the supermarket and been a short time over their stay and had been issued parking notices. Um, so, in my view, there is a remedy for so the cases that Murdo, uh, Fraser outlines where, um, in fact, some people have written to me about this in housing estates where other people park in spaces where they're not supposed to, but you might be familiar with the Dundee case where Miss McKee, a persistent offender, parked in a residence parking bay. These bays were for permit holders only. Um, there is a remedy because, after all, at the end of the day, it's a contractual obligation and that can be enforced in a court, as Murdo Fraser says. It's a civil, it's a civil matter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound very uh, I know exciting. It's true. I, I know from uh, um, 15 years but, but, of uh, experience. Um, Stuart, I'm sure you're, you're going to come in with some pearl of wisdom. Stuart. Well, no, it's not a pearl of wisdom. It's a genuine question that, that essentially here uh, the member is proposing that only public agents can recover what is a private debt. Now, there are other examples of where that sort of thing happens, like uh, policing is done at football matches and the football clubs are charged for providing that service. Is it uh, the member's intention um, that uh, the private body that's seeking to recover this private debt and is compelled to use a public officer to do so would have to pay a fee to the public uh, body that's employing the officer uh, for providing that service? Uh, that is a very fair question, Mr Stevenson. Um, I would emphasise that at this stage, this is a probing amendment. What I had sought to do through the drafting is to say, suggest there should be some public oversight in relation to the private industry. Because if you pass these amendments, you're going to give, far, I'm going to address this point, far-reaching powers and keepers liability, uh, which uh, I would suggest a code of conduct. It's not statutory. Um, and you need to be careful what you're doing here. Um, and I would like to address that, that point, but thanks for the question. Um, so the registered keeper cannot be held liable unless it can be established that they were driving the car and the alleged breach took place. This, in effect, made it difficult for parking companies to enforce the tickets against the registered keeper. But bear in mind the grounds on which a lot of these companies are seeking to enforce notices are on very, very thin uh, grounds. Um, so we've heard um, that the code of conduct, which was a uh, subject of an LCM, which Greg Knight, the MP, brought forward. Now, in the code of conduct, it, it is uh, entirely to deal with trying to regulate the private parking industry, and I think it's a good thing. Um, however, to introduce keeper liability with these amendments, uh, I think, goes way beyond at what this code of conduct seeks um, to do. Um, in fact, I would argue that, as I've said previously, uh, in England it has motorists have probably experienced uh, more draconian uh, attempts by private car parking industries um, because of some of the framing of their legislation. It has been described as a loophole. I don't believe it's a loophole um, at all. Um, so they're about enforcement. Uh, so the Amendment 266 goes even further than the powers that the police have under Section 172 of the Road Traffic Act, where it stipulates that if a driver cannot be conveniently contacted, then the registered keeper becomes liable. Now, what does that mean? I asked members to test what this word conveniently. Does that mean if you're the keeper of a vehicle and, and you are pursued and you're asked, well, were you driving the car? You say, no, it was, it was my son that was driving the car. OK, where does your son live? What attempts are being made to try and find the driver? After all, it is the driver of the vehicle which actually was the, who breached the, not, the, not necessarily the keeper. Because what keeper's liability does is it makes the keeper liable no matter what. Um, I don't think that can be right. Um, the registered keeper gives the correct details and it's not convenient for them to make the necessary. Uh, so who decides what convenient is? We've got no guidance or certainly I couldn't find any guidance as to what that actually means. In Amendment 260, it says it was immaterial for the purposes of this park whether the vehicle was permitted to be parked. To me, that is quite a wide sweeping, sweeping statement in an amendment that is immaterial for the purposes of this park whether the vehicle was permitted to be parked. I mean, to me, in plain English, that suggests that doesn't really matter. And I would suggest that the drafting of that. Um, certainly it sh shouldn't have passed Scottish ministers because 
That is far wider than we have at the moment for keepers liability. Um, I do accept that there are uh, problems in private dwellings. Uh, I've also been contacted by businesses like uh, Barclays who say, well, we've got 3,000 parking spaces and we want to make sure that therefore the, well, a lot of companies put up barriers. There are, um, there are, um, there are remedies for that. Uh, I mean, I, I have serious concerns about the, these things need to be tested and I suppose that's what stage two is for, um, but they are, uh, they, are quite, they are quite wide. As I've said previously, um, Scotland has done things differently. This is a code. Um, we haven't really had a chance to discuss what the code actually means. If we're going to just introduce keeper liability as part of bringing a code of practice, we need to be sure that the code of conduct, along with the issue of keeper's liability, does not mean that more of our constituents, because, in this, I'll just finish on this point, this creates an offence of parking by trespassing. Trespassing is not a really a feature of Scots law. Why are we going to accept a principle in Scots law that we haven't pre Parking by trespassing, believe you me, if you pass these amendments, more of your constituents, albeit under a code of conduct where there might be a, a limit on the, and we don't know what that limit is yet, um, there's too many uncertainties, convener, uh, I would ask the committee to scrutinise this very closely before you pass this into law. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pauline. There's a few members that have uh, indicated they wish to speak. Perhaps I could just ask uh, Murdo Fraser when he's summing up to clarify that uh, the position of the Code of Conduct and whether it, there is a statutory uh, uh, obligation there. And also to clarify if the code of conduct, the non-compliance with the code of conduct, will help anyone uh, regarding their appeal process, um, if, if they wanted to appeal their ticket. And, and just for the reference, um, I have been caught by one of these systems on two occasions, probably, I should admit that, but it's not going to affect how I vote. <laughs> much. Um, and on that road, uh, Mike Rumbles, uh, followed by um, Christine Graham. Mike. Thank, thanks, Convener. Um, I understand from what Murdo has said that he's put a great deal of work into this. Um, it's just that the committee is blinded on it. Um, I understand from also what he said, he's worked with the, with the Cabinet Secretary on it. Well, it hasn't come before this committee. I mean, our job is to examine the proposals brought forward to the committee, these 23 amendments in an area we've not examined. Um, we could have, you know, Murdo could have brought these forward to us in evidence at stage one. We could have taken evidence on this whole approach, and yet we're blindsided. Um, so I can't be supporting these amendments uh, for that reason alone, but I have many more um, worries about this we're changing contract law to criminal law. That's one worry. Um, I don't understand why we're, we're, we're making the keeper liable uh, under criminal law rather than the driver. There seems to me to be a complete change about, um, and we haven't, uh, I can see, well, I hope. Yeah, please. It's not changing uh, civil law to criminal law. It's, it's civil law. It's a matter of contract law. It's not changing it at all. Putting it into statute? No, it's not. It's not, it's, it's not changing something that is presently a, a civil law matter to criminal law. It's not doing that at all. Mm -hmm. it's remaining, it remains within civil law. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Thank you for that intervention, and I'm sure you'll have a chance to, to explain it in detail in your summing up, uh, this is Mr exactly, Rumbles. This is exactly what I mean. The committee has not had a chance to look at this. We, 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 we don't know anything about it. Um, that's the job of this committee to have examined all this, and that's why I'm not... Of course I will, Madam. I thought Mr. Rumbles would take an intervention on that point. He might remember, because he was on the committee last year, this committee debated a legislative consent memorandum to Sir Greg Knight's parking code of practice bill, as it was. In fact, I remember Mr. Rumbles raising precisely the issues he's raising now at that particular point. So I think, you know, it, it, you know, it's a little bit uh, pushing the boundary to say the committee has not looked at these issues because there was a debate in the committee at that time that Mr Rumbles contributed to. I thank Mayor Fraser for that intervention and for the record, so everybody's aware of this, anybody listening, that was a very brief debate uh, on a legislative consent motion. The, what I'm talking about, we've got the transport bill before us. 
and we spent a great deal of time looking at all the issues in the transport bill uh, in stage one. And there's been controversy already over the transport bill when my colleague John Finney here on the committee brought forward amendments on another issue. And then we were able to pause the stage two process and take evidence on it, a shortened evidence session, but we still took evidence on it. I, this is quite a major change in law, uh, and I think we should have given some time to it. Um, I mean, there are other issues. Uh, I'm not generally happy that um, what has happened to the protection of information that we give, give to the state, that the state is able to sell those details to private companies. Uh, I'm just not happy about it. Um, I just feel that this major issue of changing the whole focus of the law and liability in law from where it should rightly stand, which is the driver, to the keeper, is wrong in principle. Uh, and I'm not happy about it, and therefore I, I'm afraid I will not be supporting these amendments. But the most important reason why I'm not supporting these 23 amendments is that I just don't feel we've had a time to do our job on this committee and do it properly. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. Uh, Christine Graham. Well, um, I absolutely support, and uh, I don't want to patronise you, but the clarity of your explanation, because this is a civil matter of contract. And people don't understand when they drive into a supermarket car park, and there's a notice that says, uh, two hours free, overstay that £100 fine, let's say, and if you pay it within a couple of days, it's £50. They don't understand that. I think in law is an invitation to treat. In other words, you say, right, I'm going in here. This is the contract I'm entering into. And as I leave, if I've overstayed my time, there's a breach of contract and there's a, a fine imposed to that. Um, that's the first thing that they don't understand. So I think it brings clarity to, to let people know that. And it's happened where there's been free car parking before in areas. The second thing is, as the law stands, it's the driver who is liable, because they're the person who read the notice, who made the contract, who breached the contract. But the notice goes, and the penalty goes to the keeper of the vehicle, because that's all they've got access to with the registration number. <clears throat> and I, like you, got caught recently five minutes over. That's not why I think this is a good idea, because it's clarity in the law. But the notice said to me, you are the registered keeper of this vehicle, and we have been told you are the driver. Well, of course, nobody told me I was the driver. They just put that in the notice. But by doing this, you will actually have legal status to them doing, because they're issuing these notices now. So it remains a civil matter. And I think clarity is the important thing here, that people understand, and the car parking private companies, whatever you think of the money they make from it, that's irrelevant as a contract. Whatever you think of this, people will know where they are. And so if the keeper gets the notice that I got, then they'll know if this becomes law, it's legitimate. And they're liable for it if they don't declare who it is. Yes, happy to do so. I'm a bit puzzled why Christine, Graham th Christine thinks that um, it's fair, it's right and proper that someone who is not responsible for driving that vehicle suddenly becomes responsible under this law? Well, it, it exempts stolen cars and it exempts hired cars. So obviously you've given your leave to somebody to drive your car. So if you have responsibility for that vehicle. Uh, and, and I think in, in fairness to both parties, because at the moment they say it to you anyway when they have no right to say it, um, and there's no appeal. Uh, so I think many of the things you've introduced make it clear to people. And again, I reinforce this. It's a contractual matter. And contractual law prevails. That's why I cannot support uh, Polly McNeil. So when does Remember, public... Oh, let me we just finish before you get on. When, why should public authorities get involved in private contracts? It's a matter for courts. Presiding officer out of the, the committee member on this case, but you wanted to come in, Pauline. I think before I come to Colin, did you want to interrupt? Yes, I, I just uh, w wanted to ask uh, Christine Graham. Uh, first of all, um, a lot of these car parks are revenue streams for companies, which is why they really pursue people pretty hard. And how can you stop that from happening? And surely, if you did want to stop that from happening, we're going to put this into statute where the code of conduct is simply a code. Surely then, in order to balance up the protection for people, you would want to see both in statute then, surely? I think, I think you're mixing up the fact that they charge too much 
uh, the fines are heavy no. duty and you can be five no. minutes over and you end yeah. up with £100. I think you're mixing that no, up. No. The issue about the re they are revenue streams. don't think I'm happy about this. But the point I'm making is you're entering into a contract that tells you what's going to be the outcome if you go in. And the only thing the public can do is not go into them or come out early or just keep them empty. Uh, you know, vote with your car. Well, heaven's sake, I'll let Murdo Fraser defend his amendments if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not here in lieu of a Murdo. <laughs> Christine, um, uh, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on, and, and, and I would say to commi committee members and Christine, try and do this through the chair rather than just having conversations <laughs> across the fault. chamber. I think you're usually saying to me, Christine. So, <laughs> Excuse me, it's uh, not my I fault. want to come to Colin Smith, and, and then I want to go to John Finney. So, Colin, and then John, and then I'm going to go to the cabinet secretary. Colin, Th thanks very much, Kevin. I mean, oh, this is obviously a significant change. Um, uh, in, in Murdo Fraser says that, um, they, or, or sorry, as, as, as Mike Rumble says, that this committee has not taken any evidence at all on the issue of keeper liability. Um, it's been introduced here at stage two, quite late in the process. The government appeared to support it, yet no evidence was brought at all to this committee to saying the government supported this proposal. The government haven't put it in their own transport bill, despite the fact that they actually claim to, to, to support this, uh, this particular proposal. I mean, I think that, that the conduct of some of these private car parking firms are, are well documented uh, and I think Murdo Fraser's members bill um, set out proposals to tackle a large number of those but they've now been tackled four out of five of the, those issues have been tackled but the one issue keeper liability is not a single person has written to me saying that's a particular concern for them I have to say it's not the issue with these private car parking firms it's the, the abuse and the failure of these firms to follow existing rules whether it's on signage whether it's about making it clear to people what that, that they could be fined the uh, these are, I, I, I certainly certainly will yeah yeah uh, would the member accept that as well as some of the, park, the parking companies having appalling behavior some of the drivers have appalling behavior uh, I have a shopping center near me where people park sometimes in disabled spaces uh, just before nine o'clock in the morning they run off to the bus and then they come back at five o'clock uh, because it's cheaper to park in a, a space like that uh, than it is to pay in the city center so it is on both sides there's bad behavior on both sides would you accept there, there is indeed and this proposal doesn't do anything to tackle the bad behavior i mean the reality is that these companies consistently abuse the existing rules that they have, we've got a code of, of practice that isn't even statutory, and maybe that's the issue that should be addressed and, uh, if, we're, if we're going to tackle uh, this, and what's an entirely new section, in my view, uh, to, to this particular bill. So I have concern that there's been no consultation whatsoever by the government on this. I have no idea what any organisation really believes on, on this specific proposal that's before us. Um, I'm very supportive of the, of, of the bill that went through um, a UK level recently that tackled uh, most of the, of the previous concerns, but you know I, I have a real issue with this committee being asked to agree to something, which is something in the region of what 23 amendments, um, a bill in itself, quite frankly, that should be properly consulted. Thank you, Colin. Uh, John Finney, and then the Cabinet Secretary, John. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Um, I've listened intently to what Mr. Fraser says, and ordinarily. And certainly in the question of private companies, I would find myself in the polar opposite position of Mr Fraser. That's not the case on this occasion. I, I think this is a very measured response to a very well um, laid out uh, issue. Now, similarly, um, as someone who's frequently gone on about private companies um, and is concerned about issues of data protection, if I had these, then I most certainly would be hoping to articulate them today. I don't. Um, as regards the question of scrutiny, well, the committee doesn't take evidence on every conceivable thing. It's incumbent on all of us to look at proposals and do our very best to understand them and clarify them in the day. I'm satisfied that there is clarity about this. I'm satisfied that it's a, a measured response that Mr Fraser's um, uh, proposing. Would take an uh, he would. Um, it is actually quite a major piece of change in the law, this. Uh, it's not just an extra that's just been brought before the committee. Can I just give you one example of what he, does he could he tell me whether he thinks this is fair? I was in Edinburgh and my car was in Aberdeenshire and yet I got one of these notices because I had overparked apparently in Aberdeenshire. It couldn't have, couldn't have happened because I was physically here in Parliament in Edinburgh. Does he think if we change the law like this then I would have become liable for whoever used my car and received 
a penalty in that way. Do you think that's right? Do you not, are we not taking personal responsibility away from individuals? <laughs> I think we're bringing uh, responsibility into it. The reality of the situation is that, uh, as has been said, hire cars, stolen cars, whatever. There's an obligation. If you're the owner of a motor vehicle, you have obligations connected with the ownership of that vehicle. And one of them is to, to ensure that you do your very best to comply with regulations. Uh, as regards um, Pauline McNeill's um, uh, uh, amendments, I, I, I certainly don't, don't see that. There is. Uh, uh, you know, I'm someone who's very supportive of the public sector, but I, I don't see a role in this. And for these, I think you've you, you've had a, had a good chance uh, to to come. I mean, we we are 40 minutes into into the first group of amendments. You could you could. You, you absolutely can make a point of order, Mr. Roberts. In the recent stage three debates that we've just had in, in the chamber, the presiding officer was quite strong in his view that we were uh, speaking too long, uh, some members particularly speaking too long in the stage three debate, because he said that this should be, have ample time to be d debated properly at stage two. Now, if we are curtailed in what we're trying to do in stage two and we're curtailed in what we're trying to do at stage three, then I, I worry about how we are doing our job. I absolutely always would agree with the presiding officer. Um, I, I am just asking people to be mindful that, that, that there are time limits that we have to, to do, and we have had quite a full debate on this. So, Mr Finney, it's up to you if you want to take it, but, but the Cabinet Secretary still needs to come in and summarise the points, as does Murdo Fraser. Yeah, I'll perhaps leave it to the member, given the time restraints that there may be. Okay, so is that uh, I'm, I'm now concluded, thank you. Okay, um, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. As Mr Fraser has outlined, we have been working closely with the UK counterparts to regulate the private parking industry and ensure that its practices are transparent, consistent and, most of all, fair to everyone. I welcome the detail that Mr Fraser has provided in highlighting the importance of consistency and fairness to residents, motorists and landowners who are trying to effectively manage car parking that can be used for everyone. We're working closely with the UK government on this matter uh, and a range of stakeholders on the development of a statutory code of practice which will specify in detail how private car parks are to be managed. These amendments complement that work as they ensure that while we are using legislative tools to ensure best practice across the car parking industry. We are also ensuring that the industry can operate effectively, fairly and consistently across the UK. Amendment 2, uh, 268A from Paul McNeill seeks to amend Amendment 268 to require that parking notices served on drivers for the purposes of meeting one of the conditions required for the right to recover unpaid parking charges from the keeper can only be served by public bodies, thereby attempting to render the keeper liability provisions promoted by Murdo Fraser inoperable. Keeper liability is not a new concept to Scots law. Keeper liability is already used in Scotland by 21 local authorities who have decriminalised parking enforcement powers and who issue penalty charge notices to motorists who contravene on-street parking legislation. However, the private parking industry is largely governed by contract law and under contract law, the vehicle's driver is responsible for any parking charges that may arise if they contravene any of the terms of conditions of that parking contract. Currently, Private car park operators can charge for parking, but only those operators who are members of an accredited trade association can obtain vehicle keeper information from the DVLA for parking enforcement purposes. The keeper liability amendments put forward by Murdo Fraser will tackle a misconception held by many motorists in Scotland in thinking that parking charge notices issued by private parking operators are not legally enforceable and can therefore be ignored. Convener, this amendment is technically deficient as the amendment lodged by Murdo Fraser, by Murdo Fraser do not apply to public roads. Local authorities 
or state controlled parking places or any land subject to statutory control, they apply to private land. I'm happy to give way to Paul McNeill. Yeah, so on the issue of keeper liability, I just wondered if the Minister was fully satisfied with the drafting of the legislation and the one that I specifically <laughs> mentioned in, in my opening speech, where, where the phrase where it stipulates where the driver cannot conveniently be contacted. Um, I just wondered if some of the... In Amendment 2661, where it is my contention that, so there's the issue of keeper liability, but there's the drafting of these amendments, which seem to go further than the Road Traffic Act, 172 of the Road Traffic Act, because it says that it's, if a driver cannot conveniently be contacted, so I just wondered if the minister was sufficiently content with the drafting of the legislation and how that would be interpreted, because... As I said previously, conveniently can mean a whole lot of things. I don't think Police Scotland, for example, would use that term <coughs> in relation to keeper, keeper liability. I, I need to check. Uh, I need to, uh, we are confident that they are, they are correct, but I'm, I'm more than happy to take away the specific point the member raises uh, to offer further clarification. But uh, we are confident they are, they are correct um, because it's about the, the residence of the, the keeper um, of the property. So, but I'm Thank more than happy to take that away and check the point that the member raised uh, more specifically. Uh, convener, Amendment uh, 319 by Paul McNeill seeks to introduce a prohibition on the recovery of unpaid parking charges by private companies. It does this by adding a new provision to the bill preventing uh, recovery of unpaid parking charges by a person not acting in the course of employment by a public body. The amendment then goes on to define public body for the purposes of this part of the bill. The effect of the amendment would be, uh, would be to prevent private car park operators from recovering unpaid car park charges which is exactly the opposite of what Murdo Fraser is looking to do with his amendments. Furthermore, Amendment 319 would effectively... Yeah, I'm happy to give way to Mr Rumbles. I wonder if you could clarify, because this is what we are deficient, not having taken evidence on this, but as I understand it, if you have a speeding offence, then uh, obviously the, the keeper of the vehicle is contacted, and in law you are required to identify the driver if you know who that driver is, because there's been a couple of rather high-profile cases where that has been through the courts. Why is there a need to change, um, to keep a liability? Because I used the example, my own example, I was in Edinburgh, my car is in Aberdeenshire, the car, the driver of that car, uh, overstayed in a car park, and therefore I got the, the penalty, but I wasn't obliged to say who that driver was. Surely the, the way to make the law consistent is to ensure that the same laws that we have for speeding apply here. So you don't, you don't move to keep a liability, but you actually tackle the person who was responsible for the offence. So obviously for a road traffic offence, it's a criminal law matter. And the principle of uh, keep a liability applies in that the, uh, for a part for a, a, a for a speeding offence, the notice will be issued to the keeper of that vehicle. There's a legal obligation on them to then legally, under criminal law, to disclose whether it was them or if it's another party who was uh, driving the car. The difference with this is it's civil law and it's under contract law. So the contract, so the vehicle entering the, the, the site is actually, it has to comply with the contract law. Um, whoever's driving it. And the keeper is then liable for that under contract law. So it's a. So it's a. So an inanimate object. The, the person that is doing it is the driver. So, but it's the car that is. It's the person who owns the car, and it's the car that's using up that particular piece of but, but uh, parking space, which is which is why it's under contract law, and it's a civil matter but, Mr. as Rumbles, well. So, and, and, and cabinet secretary, please can, can we not have conversations in the committee? If you want to do it, do it, do it the formal way. Cabinet Secretary, so, back yeah, to you. But the, the, if you want the, to take an in, intervention, by the, all means do it, but the, please do it not by the conversation. The principal difference here is it's because it's a vehicle which is parked there, uh, whereas the person who is actually driving a vehicle over a particular speed is creating a criminal offence. They're not entering into a contract for actually having their car parked in that parking space. 
Uh, so there is a difference, and that's why it's a, it's a different arrangement. Commissioner, furthermore, Amendment uh, uh, 319 would effectively modify uh, the Scots law of contract to render persons operating these car parks unable to enforce the terms of the parking contract that the driver has entered into. Simply put, that would enable every driver to park in a private car park without paying a fee in full knowledge that the company could never recoup any charges from them. I am certain that that is not a position that anyone in this Parliament would wish to encourage. The parking industry is undergoing change for the better, and the amendments brought forward by Murdo Fraser seek to deliver consistency and fairness to operators and motorists alike. The Scottish Government supports Mr Fraser's amendments. However, I would ask Paul McNeill not to move Amendment 268A or 319, but if moved, I would urge the committee not to support them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary and Mr Fraser. Madame. Thank you, Convener. I will, I will try briefly to respond to some of the points uh, made. Uh, uh, first of all, can I thank everyone who's contributed to the uh, debate? I think it's actually been very helpful in exposing some of the issues. Uh, I think Pauline McNeill made some very good points uh, in relation to her amendments, um, uh, and I agree with a lot of what she said. Um, both she and Colin Smith and Mike Rumbles made, I think, probably the, the, the biggest complaint, if I can put it in that way, about, about a lack of consultation in advance of these amendments being lodged. Uh, in response to that, I'd just say briefly, it is, of course, up to this committee to decide if it wants to take evidence at stage two. It's quite entitled to do that. If, if committee members wanted to ask for evidence to be taken, they had that option. We did, of course, have a session in, the, in, in this committee uh, last year when this committee debated and voted on a, a legislative consent memorandum for the Parking Code of Practice Bill. So there was a discussion around these issues at that time. And as I mentioned earlier, I ran a consultation on the Members' Bill proposal. So it's not like there hasn't been any public engagement from the Parliament around these issues. That process has already been gone through, albeit I appreciate not through this uh, committee. Uh, Pauline McNeill uh, raised uh, the issue uh, of uh, the need for public oversight of private industry. And I absolutely agree with that. And, and, and that is precisely what the Parking Code of Practice Act does. And I think both Pauline and Colin Smith complained that the Code of Practice was not statutory, but that's actually a misunderstanding. It is a statutory Code of Practice. It is, it is set down in regulation uh, by ministers, um, uh, and therefore it is statutory. And those who do not comply with that statutory Code of Practice, there are sanctions against them. And the ultimate sanction is they will be deprived access to DVLA records. And without DVLA records, effectively, they will not be able to enforce their penalty notices. So it's a very severe sanction that comes uh, against them. And incidentally, I would say gently to Pauline McNeill, um, I, I know it's a popular view, but the idea that trespass is not part of Scots law is not something that many Scots lawyers will recognise. It's not but, a major principle. Um, well, it's, it's, if you study Scots property law, as I'm sure uh, Christine Graham would confirm, Trespass does form part of, of Scots, Scots law, so it does exist. But that's by, that's by the by. That's by the by. Um, Mike, Mike Rumble said he was, he was not happy uh, that DVLA were selling information uh, to third parties, and I absolutely agree with him. But that's precisely the, the ill that the Parking Code of Practice Act seeks to deal with. The Parking Code of Practice Act makes it more difficult for companies to... Uh, acquire information from DVLA, and they will only be able to do so if they can demonstrate uh, compliance with this new statutory uh, code of practice. Yes, of course. I think the main issue is this change from uh, liability to the keeper of the vehicle rather than the driver of the vehicle. I think that's the nub of the whole issue. But I have got a technical question. I wonder if we could, in a summing up, uh, address it. I don't quite understand. In paragraph 260, in Amendment 260, uh, paragraph 2, it says, It is immaterial for the purpose of this part whether or not the vehicle was permitted to be parked or to remain parked on the land. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means. Could you explain? I understand these amendments are modelled on uh, the um, Protection of Freedoms Act 2012, which was passed um, in relation to England and Wales. And these, these amendments are, are modelled upon that and take their wording uh, from that. And, and this really, I th as I understand it, this wording is intended to make it clear that, that this bill relates to the recovery of unpaid parking charges rather than the question of consent to park on land. 
I don't know if that's a sufficient explanation for the, for the member, but that's probably the best I can do at the moment. Um, if I could just close, uh, Convener. Um, I think what this debate for the last you know, 50 minutes or so has actually demonstrated very helpfully is the lack of certainty there is around the law or around private park, parking in Scotland. And it's that certainty and that confusion that is at the heart of the problem. Only 25% of parking notices in Scotland are currently being paid. A lot of people think they can just put them in the bin, that they're not enforceable. In fact, they are enforceable, as the Cabinet Secretary fairly said. Some people end up being taken to court. Um, a lot of angst and suffering is caused as a result of this. What we need is greater certainty and greater clarity. And what I'm proposing is part of a package of reform uh, that will provide better certainty and clarity, both for those who are parking their vehicles and for those who are operating an industry here and those who have legitimate interest to protect their uh, parking spaces. Thank you, uh, Murdo. Could I ask you to press or withdraw your amendment then, please? I'll, amend, I'll press Amendment 260. Okay, the question therefore is Amendment 260 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes in favour, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 260 is agreed. The question now is that Amendment 261 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Oh, sorry, I've got to call it. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun again. Maybe it getting cited here as, as we move through a list of amendments. So I call Amendment 261 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 261 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for. There is one vote against. There's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 261 is agreed. I call Amendment 262 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Uh, moved. If it's helpful, Convener, can I move on block all the amendments? No, because oh. uh, the way the voting's happening, right. we'll have to go through them individually. Thank you for that kind offer. The question, <laughs> therefore, is that Amendment 262 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 262 is agreed. I therefore call Amendment 263 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. And the question is that Amendment 263 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 263 is agreed. I call Amendment 264 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260, Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 264 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed, there's a division, those in favour please raise their hands. Those against please raise their hands. And those who wish to abstain please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there is one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 264 is agreed. I call Amendment 265 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question therefore is Amendment 265 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. And those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 265 is agreed. The question there, oh sorry, I need to call Amendment 266 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 266 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 266 is agreed. I call Amendment 267 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, Amendment 267 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. 
Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 267 is agreed. I call Amendment 268 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. I therefore call Amendment 268A in the name of Paul... Sorry? No, because that's an amendment to it. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry? Sorry, you're right. You're right. Okay. Nothing better than when the con con convener's right. So I would like... <laughs> uh, Mr. Balfour, please remember that it will be me that gives you the opportunity to speak later in the committee meeting. I therefore call Amendment 268A in the name of Paulie McNeil, already debated with Amendment 260. Paulie McNeil, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Uh, I th uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 268 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, and there's one abstention, and therefore Amendment 268 is agreed. Pattern about the voting. Uh, <laughs> would it not be possible to move them as a block? Um, I'm, I'm sure it would be uh, possible to do anything, but parliamentary procedure, I'm told by the clerks, means that I have to go through each one. Um, and before Christine Graham comes in and tells me that there's a way around that, um, I'm, I'm going to keep pushing on with it. I'm, I'm sorry, and thank you uh, uh, again. Call Amendment 269 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 269 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Thank you. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hand. And yes, the pattern continues. There are nine votes for, one vote against, one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 269 is agreed. I the quest, uh, therefore call Amendment 270 in the name of Murdo Fraser. Already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 270 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Uh, those in favour, <laughs> please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. And those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. Sorry, there are nine votes for, one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 270 is agreed. I call Amendment 271 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 271 it be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And we're not agreed, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 271 is agreed. I call Amendment 272 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 272 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes, yes. We are not agreed, there is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. <laughs> Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 272 is agreed. Call Amendment 273 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 273 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, uh, was one abstention, 273 amendment is agreed. I call amendment 274 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 260, Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is therefore that amendment 274 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed, there's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hand. There's nine votes for, with one vote against and one abstention, therefore amendment... 274 is agreed. I call Amendment 275 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 275 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. 
Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for, there's one vote against, and there's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 275 be agreed. I call Amendment 276 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is, therefore, that Amendment 276 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We, we're not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Oh. Those against? Those who wish to abstain? <laughs> there are nine votes for, there's one vote against, there's one abstention. <laughs> Therefore, Amendment 276 be agreed. I call Amendment 277 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 277 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are nine votes for. There's one vote against. There's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 277 be ag is agreed. I call Amendment 278 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. I have the question is that Amendment 278 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hand. There's nine votes for. There's one vote against. There's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 278 be agreed. I call Amendment 319 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 260. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Ah. We are now moving on to the enforcement of parking regulations in the vicinity of schools. And I'd like to call Amendment 316 in the name of Jamie Green, grouped with Amendment 317. Jamie Green to move Amendment 316 and speak to both amendments in the group. Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Um, I move the amendments in my name. Uh, I apologise to members. I've uh, almost lost my voice. The Transport Bill has finished me off completely so um, I'll keep my comments as brief as I can and hopefully they'll ramp up the volume for me so I don't have to shout. Um, this, uh, this amendment is, um, has been brought forward uh, um, to try and address an issue that I think many of us deal with on a regular basis and that's the issue around parking outside schools. Um, I'm sure many of us will uh, drive past schools in the morning on the way to Parliament and see the signs outside school saying please do not park at the entrance or begging drivers to not park in an obstructive manner, especially on zigzag lines. Now last year when we started discussing uh, regulations around pavement double parking, um, my office was contacted by Dundee City Council who have, who have a, an issue with enforcing parking outside schools and I was quite intrigued to see what this issue was so they requested a meeting between uh, local councils, traffic wardens and the local police. Uh, uh, who uh, regularly enforce traffic outside schools. So we went along to see what the problem was. And what is clear is that there is a problem. There's a lot of confusion, actually, I think, as we saw from <coughs> previous amendments to this bill around who can enforce what, uh, what powers traffic wardens have in decriminalised areas and what powers police have. And the reality is that the, the picture is quite complex. And, and I, I'd like to think we can try, as a committee, deal with this using the transport bill as a vehicle to do so. Um, at the moment, uh, the reality is that outside many schools there are both traffic wardens and police officers uh, trying to regulate and manage uh, the huge volumes of traffic outside schools in the morning. Um, there are many questions as to who can do what and the questions include can a traffic warden put a ticket on a car which is parked on a double yellow line? Can a traffic warden put a ticket on a car which is on a yellow zigzag which has yellow lines? Can a traffic warden put a ticket on a yellow zigzag which has no yellow lines or signage? Can a police officer put a ticket on a car which is committing a breach which ordinarily would be enforced by a traffic warden in, in a decriminalised parking area where there is no traffic warden, uh, regardless of whether an obstruction is deemed to be taking place or not? And can a traffic warden issue a ticket to a car which is parked on a white zigzag? So I think I'm painting a picture of some of the complexities here. What's happening at the moment is, in Dundee, for example, there are three full-time parking wardens, or park, parking attendants, and 15 part-time attendants, which is all well and good, but there are 46 schools in Dundee. 
So what that requires is a quite a complex structure of buddying up, whereby around some schools where there is, are bigger problems, there are police officers enforcing uh, cars which are parked obstructively in some parts, and traffic wardens enforcing other breaches of uh, decriminalised parking rules. Where there are no traffic wardens, there is only the police, and the police uh, are therefore unable to uh, issue uh, tickets in the uh, breaches where normally a traffic warden would apply a ticket, and equally there are areas where there is only a traffic warden but not a police officer, and they are unable to enforce uh, those lines. So I think, again, that uh, paints the picture of the problem here. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. Hey, I thank the member for giving way, and I mean the picture he paints is, is probably similar in Glasgow. There is no way that there are enough police or traffic wardens together to uh, staff all the schools in Glasgow where there's a parking problem. So would he accept that actually the answer is not WL lines, it's not zigzag lines, it's exclusion zones around the school, because whatever signs you have, they will not be enforced. I think the member makes a very good point. Um, I think you're right. The, the way to address this problem is not to, to put a police officer and a parking warning outside every school. I think the way to do this is to actually use regulation, the powers that we have as a parliament and that the minister has, to uh, create regulations which address this problem. Now, I don't know what the answer is. It may be an exclusion zone. I've come up with another solution in my amendment here. One solution is to ask the minister to bring forward regulations to uh, create uh, zones around schools, which are the vicinity of a school, which will be specified times and days when those uh, zones can be enforced, and that any car parked within that vicinity would be creating an obstruction, which therefore could be enforced by the police, for example. Now, again, this may not be, may be the answer, but it's certainly a proposal. And can, and can I thank the, uh, the, the, the Parliament's um, uh, Clark team who helped me word this? Um, it, it is complex. Um, but what I would like to do is, is, is ask the government to, that by its very nature, take on board this amendment away and work with the committee and members who have an interest in this to come up with a solution. I don't think the status quo is good enough. Quite frankly, I don't think the status quo works. Um, I'm, un, I'm of the view, and I'm sure I'll hear from the minister, that my, uh, that my proposal is perhaps one way of addressing it, by either giving powers to police officers to enforce the bits of decriminalised parking outside schools that they can't do, or indeed to give parking wardens the, the power to enforce bits that police currently do outside schools. And this is only around schools, by the way. This is not a general uh, sweeping uh, uh, mixing of powers between uh, decriminalised parking and the police, because they are two distinct areas. I think the fact that there is, uh, there is such a, a, an anomaly in, in who can uh, enforce what means that there is an issue. The way to solve that, as John Mason said, is not simply to staff it with more people, but is actually to change the regulations that enforce obstructive behaviour. At the moment, it's unacceptable, I think, that schools are begging drivers, saying, please don't park here. Then it needs to be better than that. It needs to be quite simply that, park, that drivers cannot park there and should not. And if they do, then that is enforceable by somebody or a and other. And I don't know who uh, that has to be in each circumstance. So, of course, there are local authorities that do not have decriminalised parking, in which case it is up to the police. At the moment, all I know is that if there are schools where, that I've been to where there is a police officer and a traffic warden who have to be there at the same time in the mornings and the evenings to enforce this, then something isn't quite right. If they're telling me that they're not happy and that the system's not good enough, then I think we have a duty to fix it, and that's the premise of my amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. There's two members that have indicated they wish to speak. First of all, Mike Rumbles. Thank you, I think this is a very good amendment. I am conscious, though, of, I've heard uh, the um, Cabinet Secretary on a previous occasion, on previous amendments in this bill, saying it was clear that um, what, uh, what, what obstructions were outside schools. But actually, I, I, I'm tending to agree with Jamie Green that... Um, we could do with some clarity. Now, I, I am conscious that we've just passed 20 amendments uh, on Murdo Fraser's amendments, which was calling for clarity. Um, I, I think having passed those amendments, we'll see a lot more people before the courts, but never mind. Um, I actually think on this amendment, uh, it does request the Cabinet Secretary to go out and produce regulations to make it absolutely beyond doubt mm. that this would cause obstructions around these schools. So I think... We should support it. And, and I, I heard what Jimmy Green said about maybe working with the Minister for Stage 3. I always think it's better to get something like this on, 
on the on the in the bill at stage two, and work with the minister at stage three to to tinker with it, if that's the right word I could use, um, or to to to, to um, get it absolutely right um, beyond beyond doubt. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile that the minister sh should perhaps do that. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious I'm speaking before the minister speaks, so I don't know what his view is about this amendment. Um, but I'm, I think I would like to, uh, if Jamie decides not to move it, I think I would like to move it. So I hope you will move this am amendment. Thank you. Mike, uh, Colin, you want to say something? I mean, I think I think what Jamie Green brings forward is a is a really important issue, and it's one that that, that, that is certainly in I think all of our uh, inboxes um, uh, and something we see on an almost daily basis. I, I very much welcome the fact um, that he's brought this um, amendment forward. Whether the amendment itself will tackle what is I think largely an enforcement issue, uh, I'm not convinced. Uh, but uh, and I'd be keen to hear what local authorities would have to say um, on the particular proposals itself. But I mean, I know it's in subsection E. Um, it, it calls for this to be enforced by constables. Uh, well, most councils in Scotland obviously now have decriminalised parking enforcement, and I think this exposes yet again the inconsistencies we have. I mean, last week we debated the issue of enforcement of the ban on parking on cycle lanes, and we discussed the fact that the police could currently enforce such a ban, but even when parking is decriminalised, uh, the council can't enforce the ban unless there's a T. RO, and we know from the bill that the proposal is that pavement parking will be enforced by councils, even where we have, um, where we don't have decriminalised parking. So you have, as I've raised before, the crazy situation where a council enforcement officer, where they haven't decriminalised parking, will walk down the street and be able to ticket a car parked on the pavement, but they won't be able to ticket a car parked on WA lines right next to it. And I think these anomalies uh, in this whole issue of, of decriminalising parking it is not being addressed by this bill and I think the government are actually ducking the issue and I think that's disappointing given the fact we've got an opportunity to try and tackle it as part of the transport bill. Thank you very much uh, Colin. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener Amendment uh, 316 from Jamie Green seeks to place the responsibility for enforcing parking at or near schools on the police rather than local authorities. I recognise that parking at or in the vicinity of schools has become a growing problem in recent years as more people have complained about the impact this parking has on surrounding residential streets. Whilst I appreciate the concerns behind Jamie Green's amendment, there are some fundamental issues with the amendment as drafted. For example, it does not offer a definition of vicinity of school uh, by regulating this to subordinate legislation. This is something that could be very difficult to define and may vary depending on the location and the site of the school. It would also arguably be unworkable in residential areas where the majority of schools are based and could result in local residents committing offences for parking outside their homes. And I say that as someone who stays next to a primary school. If the government had included such a vague and wide-ranging power in the bill at introduction, I've got no doubt it would have attracted a great deal of criticism from the DP. LRC committee. Furthermore, Amendment 316 seeks to create a new criminal offence which the police will be required to enforce irrespective of whether the local authority in question has obtained decriminalised parking enforcement powers. This goes against our policy on decriminalised parking enforcement which seeks to give local authorities full control over parking and thereby freeing up vital police resources. Finally, convener, as I explained in last week's committee session when addressing Mark Rusko's amendment 290 and 291 on a similar issue, the Traffic Signs Regulations and General Directions 2016 and the Road Traffic Act 1988 already make it an offence to park on a school entrance zigzag marking enforceable by the police. Should local authorities with decriminalised parking enforcement powers wish to enforce these or prohibit parking during specified times in neighbouring streets, they can do so by including them in a traffic regulation order. This procedure for doing so enables local, local residents to give fair notice of parking proposals affecting their area. The amendments proposed by Jamie Green 
while well meaning are unworkable in practice and would cut across the right of local authorities to effectively manage parking in their own areas. I will, however, let me finish this point first of all. I will, however, make a commitment to write to all 21 local authorities who have decriminalised parking enforcement powers to remind them of what powers they have and what they can do to enforce parking at or near schools. However, I am more than happy to discuss the issue further with the member in greater detail to consider further me what further measures can be taken forward. I'm happy to give way to Mr Rumbles now. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wanted to ask you a, really, a, a fundamental question about regulation of parking outside of our schools across the country. You seem to be saying, um, well, from, from your previous uh, discussion of Mark Ruskell's amendment, uh, you were saying, you know, you wanted to get rid of some urban myths that this, this was already against the law um, and that there were powers available to councils. But there is, uh, would you accept that there, there is genuine confusion out there as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed? And yet we don't have that with very many other traffic regulations um, that apply throughout the country. Uh, w would you, in principle, agree that, you, that, that it would be helpful if the government brought forward regulations which clarified ex exactly what the law says and what the law allows and what the law doesn't allow and put them in a formal matter of, of, of government regulations? Maybe the, I think there may be some confusion between clarity and enforcement. Where the matter has not been decriminalised, it is a matter for the police to enforce. So for vehicle parks, as I mentioned, on uh, the zigzag markings at a school, then uh, the police can enforce that. Uh, the person's committing an offence and it can be enforced. Where it has been decriminalised, it is then a matter for the parking enforcement officers from the local authority to do so. However, if the police see a vehicle parked in an area which is causing an obstruction, they can still issue a notice to that person uh, for committing an offence. So there is, let me, just, let me just finish this point I want to make here. So the issue is about local authorities um, making sure that where it's been decriminalised is that they are adequately enforcing the provisions that they have put in place around schools. So even with the greater clarity, I suspect the core issue here will return to the point of enforcement of these provisions um, around schools uh, and having that carried out on a consistent basis. So there is, in my view, already an existing level of clarity there, but I'm keen to look at identifying ways in which we can potentially offer greater clarity. I suspect that's not in regulation. I suspect that's more about giving uh, local authorities more details and reinforcing that information uh, to them. But I suspect, at the very core of all of this, it's the issue of enforcement rather than new law being required to deal with the issue. Happy to uh, take a point from Mr Smith. The Cabinet Secretary said he will write to the 21 local authorities that have decriminalised parking to remind them effectively of uh, the requirement for them to enforce it. But he's not accepting the 11 local authorities that haven't decriminalised parking. Responsibility for enforcement rests with Police Scotland and their failing to enforce parking regulations at the moment, and should you not be writing to all, um, not just the 21 local authorities with decriminalised parking, but also to Police Scotland, reminding them of their um, responsibilities to properly enforce parking, because frankly, it's not being enforced at the moment. And if the government's view is that the Police Scotland should no longer enforce parking, then frankly, you should decriminalise car parking instead of leaving the anomalies that we've got at the moment. Which is our preferred option, but it's the choice of a local authority to choose to do so or not. Uh, we can't force um, uh, a local authority to take forward a measure that it doesn't choose to do. Uh, but it is our preferred option and we have a process there for them to engage in if they do want to decriminalise the process. What I can say, convener, is that um, I think the, the nub of this is the issue of enforcement uh, and that being adequately enforced. And I'm more than happy to take that point away and to look at, well, as I've mentioned, are there further measures that could be taken to try and ensure that local authorities are doing more um, alongside Police Scotland uh, in, in dealing with parking issues uh, around school because I recognise the challenges which can uh, occur. However, um, the other part to this is that in dealing with enforcement is there's also a need for uh, car users to understand uh, the risk they put children at 
uh, by being inconsiderate uh, and not considering the implications of their parking behaviour uh, around schools. So we can do as much as we can in terms of trying to encourage greater enforceability, but there's also a personal responsibility on car users to recognise the risks that they create for children by irresponsibly parking in areas around schools where they should not. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Jamie Green, to uh, wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. Uh, can I just pick the Cabinet Secretary up on a few points um, he, the, the, in his comeback? Uh, the, he said he talked about the vicinity, and it's difficult to define. But if you look at the comment made by John Mason around creating an exclusion zone, that by default would require a definition of what the zone is. Um, it's not impossible to say that where the perimeter of the school ends that then is residential, for example, in the example of, of the place where you live. Um, it's entirely possible to set a vicinity of something. Uh, uh, it doesn't need to be on the face of the bill. I'm not asking it to be. Um, you're also saying that you have a problem that we're creating an offence to cause an obstruction at school. Absolutely. That's the whole point of this, is that uh, inconsiderate driving outside schools is not just inconsiderate, it's dangerous. So it should be an offence. Um, and the issue around the enforcement of zigzags at the moment, as you rightfully said, that... Yes. It is already a fence. This is about creating a new offence uh, over and above uh, the provisions that are already in place for those areas where it is parking enforcement officers yep. that carry out for local authorities. So it, it, it'd be wrong to give the impression that it is not an existing offence. I think it'd also be wrong to give the impression that it's currently the case that there are always traffic wardens and police officers outside schools. Because where there are police officers but not traffic wardens in decriminalised areas, the police officers cannot uh, put tickets on cars that normally a traffic warden would, is my understanding. Well, that's not the uh, feedback I've had from police. The, so perhaps, the, so perhaps even in decriminalised areas, they can still do so. OK, well, I, I appreciate we have to move on. So uh, I, I would like to close by thanking at least members for, for taking my, my amendment seriously. I think this is an important issue. I don't think it's a political one. Um, I don't think just writing to the local authorities that have decriminalised parking is enough. There, uh, as, uh, even, even the ones that have decriminalised parking, they don't have enough traffic wardens. Dundee Council's 28 traffic wardens short of policing every school every day when it has to. Now, you could argue that's their problem. But there clearly is a reason why they don't have enough traffic wardens. It could be budgetary reasons or otherwise. But just saying that's your problem is not good enough. Um, equally, there are 11 local authorities that don't have decriminalised parking, where the police aren't necessarily resourced to be outside every school in each of those council areas either. That would require hundreds of additional police officers to be outside schools. So that's not happening either. So it's not happening. It's don't, I don't think this is about enforcement. It's, I think it's about getting the powers in the right place so that there is... Outside schools only, some interchangeability around traffic wardens and police being able to ensure that cars uh, are not parked uh, in a dangerous manner. And I think that's all I'm asking the government to look at. Sending a letter to councils, I don't think is enough. But if the minister is willing to work, again, with me or any other member who has an interest in this, to look at, uh, at what we could do on the face of this transport bill, which addresses a whole other range of issues around parking, to make sure there's something in here that says that we will take this issue seriously and we will get it right. I'd be very happy to work with, with anyone who's, who is willing to do that. Thank you. So, uh, Jamie, I have to ask you if you want to press or withdraw your amendment. Uh, I'll withdraw. Uh, does anyone wish to object to Jamie I'll Green press. withdrawing his amendment? I'll press it. OK, so we have to go straight to calling the amendment, and that is the question, therefore, is Amendment 316 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish... No, there's no abstentions. So I was getting carried away with previous votes. Five votes for, six votes against. Therefore, Amendment 316 is not agreed. We're now going to move on to... Uh, the section on proposed cycle tracks and a duty to consult on access panels. I want to call Amendment 259 in the name of Jeremy Balfour in a group on its own. Jeremy, can I ask you to move and speak to Amendment 259? Uh, uh, good morning, Committee, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I start by saying um, a journey is only accessible as its least accessible part? And I think that's a really important thing 
to remember, as we look at a few of the amendments I bring forward, we can have the most accessible um, paths uh, and buses and other things, but unless the whole journey is accessible, then one little bit can stop a disabled person being able to get to where they want to get. And many disabled people find their journeys interrupted at the very first stage, that being on the pavement. Let me make it clear that my amendment is not saying we shouldn't have shared spaces. In fact, shared spaces, I think, can work really well. But what this amendment seeks to do is to say that there's an inconsistent design of payments and an increase of use of shared space, which means that disabled people find this difficult to get around. If I can cite an example here in Edinburgh, uh, if you go down uh, Leaf, uh, if you go down le uh, towards uh, Leaf Walk um, from a playhouse um, on the left-hand side, there is a shared pathway at uh, most of that road. Uh, the only designation to show which is a cycle lane and which is for pedestrians walking is a white line. Now, if you have a visual impairment, if you have um, complete blindness, if you have another disability, you can, without any thought of your own, simply walk in to the cycle path and have no warning that you've moved from the pavement walking to the cycle path itself. Um, and I've had a number of constituents and a number of people from across Scotland giving me other examples of that. Now, there are ways around that. There can be different forms of um, identifying which is the cycle path and which is the area that pedestrians should walk. Um, and that can give uh, people who use dogs or other um, devices to help them in regard to a disability a much clearer understanding. What this amendment says is that before any of these shared spaces are created, then the local authority should consult with access panels so that they can be involved in the evaluation and the designing of this. It would require local authorities to consult with them. Uh, access panels would be able to have um, an input but they would not be able to stop them in any way at all. But hopefully with their information, with their sharing, then any areas can be made much more accessible and shared spaces can become a lot safer. Uh, ab absolutely, Mr Finney. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Balfour for taking the intervention. It, to my mind, it would be good practice that this were happening in any case. Yeah. Is, is, is it the case that this is not happening? Um, I think it is varied across different parts of Scotland, and I certainly know some local authorities that simply go ahead and do them without consulting with the access panels. So this is, I think, good practice. I think it's simply putting good practice. Now, the Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, apologies, uh, may come back and say there are no access panels within every local authority, and I do accept that. Um, and if the principle of this was acceptable, um, within the planning bill, um, uh, last week, I made some alterations to my amendments to give um, a slightly wider scope beyond access panels, because I do appreciate that not every local authority does have one, although I think almost everyone is nearly there. But for me, I think the principle is to say we want shared spaces, but we want a clear designation so that disabled people and actually other individuals, um, um, absolutely. You say about not every local authority has an access panel, but you're making it mandatory that the roads authority must consult the access panel. If they've got one, they can't consult. Well, yeah, true. So, I mean, I think I'm, I, I am happy if the uh, taking Mike Wumble's uh, position, if we get this in, I'm happy to clean up the wording at stage three. But I think the, the principle is that most local authorities do now have access panels. They are up and running. There's a there's a national access panel group in which comes together they can be used as well but i think for me the principle here is to say that uh, those with disabilities do need to make sure that there is um, clear signage and clear identification which is the cycle path and, and which is the area uh, thank you convener thank you uh jeremy uh, colin you wanted to say something Thanks, I, mean, I very much welcome um, Amendment 259 by Jeremy, Cor Jer Jeremy Bal Balfour. <laughs> um, it's I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure who... I'm, I'm not sure who'd be most upset by that comment. Um, COVID. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, issue, 
The issue of, of accessibility in our transport system uh, in our streets has come up quite a few times in this bill, and I think stakeholders have made it clear that the status quo is not good enough, and we need to use the opportunity of this bill to, to I think, strengthen the laws to underpin uh, improvements. I think too often the needs of disabled people are being overlooked in the development of cycle lanes, be it the needs of, of disabled cyclists or pedestrians themselves. One issue that I raised in a previous amendment was that of, of floating bus stops in which cycle lanes run between bus stops and the pavement, causing what is a, a serious hazard for blind and visually impaired people. Uh, and it's clear that uh, in the case of these being uh, implemented, there was insufficient uh, consultation with access panel or, or, or similar uh, groups representing the views of, of disabled people. So I think this, is, this amendment would be a welcome addition uh, and it would give a clear statute underpinning to best practice. So I, I'm more than happy to, to support amendment uh, 259 from uh, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you. Uh, Christine, I wasn't sure whether your intervention w w was... The word must. OK. Uh, Mike Rumbles, Mike, and then the Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, um, convener. Yeah, this is um, simply putting good practice into law, um, which, make, which ensures that it's a, re a requirement. I think it's a very worthwhile amendment. And I take Christine Graham's point, uh, uh, and of course J Jeremy's response to it, that um, it's not perfect, the amendment, but I think obviously because not every local authority might have a uh, an access panel. So uh, on the basis that I think it's a good idea to put it in the bill and then again work on the on the actual wording for stage three perhaps with the minister, with the cabinet secretary, to make sure that the government is happy with it as well, rather than just oppose it, I think, which I hope the government isn't just simply going to do. Um, I, I'll be supporting it, supportive of it. Um, get it in on, on stage two and we can come back and look at it again at stage three in the full parliament. Thank you very much, my uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, uh, Jeremy <coughs> Balfour, definitely Jeremy Balfour. Uh, his amendment uh, 259 seeks to place a duty on local authorities to consult an access panel of local residents prior to making a road or part of a road a cycle track. Whilst I fully appreciate the intention behind this amendment, local authorities are already subject to statutory duties requiring them to carry out extensive consultation prior to making cycle tracks on their roads. An order redetermining a length of road to make it a cycle track is a redetermination order under section 1522 of the Road Scotland Act 1984 not section one of the proposed amendment as it states. Uh, the procedure for making these orders is set out in the stopping up of roads and private accesses and the redetermination of public rights of passage, Procedure Scotland Regulation 1986, which I'm sure all the committee are familiar with. This existing consultation requir requires uh, to go well beyond that set out in this proposed amendment. And where any proposal is the subject of an objection that is not withdrawn following written explanation from the local authority, that proposal is ultimately, ultimately requires to be remitted to Scottish ministers for consideration. In addition, with respect to accessibility considerations, it should be noted that through the whole redetermination process, both local authorities and Scottish ministers have a duty to have regard to the requirements of the Equalities Act 2010. Therefore, I don't consider that it needs to, we need to impose an additional duty on local authorities as proposed in this amendment, uh, even with uh, the technical issues relating to the amendment itself. However, I am more than happy to engage with the member prior to stage three to consider whether there are further measures that we can take forward under the existing procedure that would provide greater clarity to the objectives that the member is seeking to achieve. And therefore, I would ask him not to press Amendment 259, but if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to wind up. Uh, thank you, I, I, I welcome, to some extent, the uh, Cabinet Secretary's uh, remarks, particularly his final remarks, about uh, perhaps working with him to see if we can find something. I, I mean, I do think there is a principle that, yes, local authorities do have to consult, but I do think we need to move access panels uh, to a higher level, to almost where we have community councils, where we do become statutory groups, if they exist, 
that they should be consulted with, because I do think to expect access panels to know everything that is going on um, within the even area is asking a lot of volunteers. And for example, I do know that the uh, path I was talking about here in Edinburgh, the access panel in Edinburgh was, did not respond to, we simply didn't know about it till too late. But in the light of what the Minister um, has said, um, I won't push this today, uh, but I will uh, be knocking on his door uh, before stage three. Yeah, does any member wish to uh, object to amendment uh, 259 being withdrawn? No, therefore it's withdrawn. So the question is at this stage is that sections 59 and 60 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, I am going to suspend the committee for literally five minutes. Uh, I would ask you to be back here ready to go at 10.45. I therefore suspend the committee.
reconvene the meeting and we are now going on to the section on roadworks. And I'm going to call Amendment 164 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with amendments as shown in the grouping. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 164 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Convener, the amendments in this group in my name are largely minor or technical in nature. The Transport Scotland Act 2005 imposes a duty on the Scottish Road Works Commissioner to make the Scottish Roads Works Register available for inspection. In practice, the ability to inspect the register does not make information about roadworks, which may be of interest to the general public, particularly accessible. Separately, certain information on the register may be commercially sensitive or may give rise to security considerations, and it therefore is not considered that such information should be freely available to the public. Amendment 165 therefore changes the current approach by firstly requiring the Commissioner to make publicly available information on the register about the timing, duration, location and purpose of the works in roads. It is intended that this will make such information more accessible than would be the case if members of the public were simply permitted to inspect the register. Scottish Ministers will have powers to prescribe further information to which the Commissioner should provide public access. Amendment 165 also requires the Commissioner to make all of information on the register available to persons with authority to carry out works on inroads and to those whom the Commissioner considers have a sufficient interest in that information. This will ensure that the information necessary to ensure the safety of any works is available to those who need it. New section 61B of the Road Scotland Act 1984, inserted by section 60 of the bill, currently requires the use of suitably trained operatives and supervisors only where works involve breaking up or tunnelling under the road or any subsequent reinstatement. However, in practice, road authorities often undertake activities such as painting road markings, flushing blockages in road drains and filling in pot hot potholes with temporary material. These activities are undertaken to are unlikely to include any breaking up of the road surface, but may require traffic management and other safety measures on the carriageway. For safety reasons, it is considered that the carrying out of uh, any works involving traffic management on carriageways should be subject to similar requirements as to the use of trained operatives and supervisors, irrespective of whether they involve breaking up the reinstatement of the road, and Amendment 166 will secure that. Amendment 183 requires an application for want to exercise enforcement powers and for appeals against compliance notices to be made to sheriffs rather than to summary sheriffs, as was the case under the bill as introduced. This follows representation made by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service that applications of this kind may be inconsistent with the existing remit of summary sheriffs. In its stage one report of the bill, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee identified an incorrect cross-reference in provision in certain, inserted into the new Roads and Streetworks Act 1991 by section 61.3 of the bill. I would like to thank the committee for their diligent scrutiny of the bill, and Amendment 164 corrects that cross-reference. Cross amendments 181 and 182 are also minor amendments, removing definitions inserted by the bill into the Transport Scotland Act 2005. Amendment 232, in Jamie Green's name, seeks to place a duty on Roadworks Authorities and Scottish Roadworks, the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner to set aside 5% of the money raised by, issue, by the issuing penalties for roadworks offences and ring fencing it for road maintenance purposes. While this may seem like a sensible way to contribute to better maintaining, maintaining roads, in practice it would not achieve its purpose. The income received from issuing fixed penalties in Scotland is relatively limited. For example, Aberdeenshire Council reported receiving £2,600 in fixed penalty notices income during 2018. This amendment would result in £130 of that being set aside for road maintenance rather than the administration of the scheme. At those low levels, this would contribute almost nothing to road maintenance, but would reduce the revenue available to meet the costs of the scheme, restricting the time which can be dedicated to enforcement of compliance with roadworks duties. 
Given the historically small levels of income raised by these penalties, I am not persuaded that the administrative burden associated with requiring the Commissioner's penalties to be remitted to Ministers and then redistributed to Roadsworks authorities is justified by the scale and nature of the likely benefits. There is, like, there is uh, in addition, strong evidence to suggest that fixed penalties are successful in improving compliance with roadworks duties, and I am concerned that giving these penalties a revenue-raising purpose could undermine that success. The intention of Amendment 325, also in the name of Jamie Green, is to ensure that delays uh, to certain roadworks, of which advance notice is required, specifically major roadworks and works in traffic sensitive areas, may only be implemented with the approval of the Roadworks Authority and the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner. Convener, in my view, this proposed, um, uh, proposal requires, uh, require, is, as set out, is unnecessary. There are already existing, there is a they are, they are, they are, uh, already exists an established system covered in considerable detail in the nationally applicable code of practice for coordination of roadworks, for dealing with approval for works which need to start later than indicated by a notice under section 113 of the new Roads and, new and Street Works Act 1991. Under these processes, undertakers must seek Roadworks Authority approval for these delayed starts and may incur a Commissioner penalty for failure to cooperate where they fail to do so. There is considerable industry buy-in to this framework, the success of which is demonstrated by the fact that no Commissioner penalties have been issued on this ground because compliance levels are so high. And it has achieved its objectives without placing an excessive burden on the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner in relation to operational matters, when this, his role is otherwise entirely strategic. I therefore cannot support amendments 320 and 321, and I would invite the member not to move them. However, if they are moved, I would ask the committee to vote against them. But I would ask the committee to agree on amendments that are in my name in this group, and I move amendment 164. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, uh, to speak to Amendment 320 and any other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, uh, for the spirit in which he gave his comments to my amendments. Um, the, the intentions of them I'll, I'll briefly outline. 320, as he said, uh, is to ensure that at a minimum uh, of 5% of the revenues achieved from the fixed penalty notices given for uh, failure to comply with compliance notice it would be uh, reserved uh, solely for the purpose of improving the repair and maintenance of roads. I think we'll all uh, understand that the issue of, of road surface quality is, is a big issue. Uh, it's a big issue right across the UK, indeed, not just in Scotland, although perhaps more so in Scotland, where we have uh, far many uh, few, uh, uh, rural roads uh, driven by fewer motorists. So um, this is an issue, and local councils uh, have... Uh, had severe pressures on their ability to uh, improve road quality. I, I perhaps rather than simply call for uh, money to be spent, I perhaps saw this as an opportunity to at least seek the funding for where that money might come from. I think uh, equally if the Minister thinks that 5% won't achieve very much, maybe I should have brought the amendment forward saying that 95% would have been a better figure. Uh, maybe I can do that at stage three. Um, but I think the purpose of this really is to raise awareness of the issue that um, I, again, I'm not aware of what the scale of these funds are from these pick, pick, fixed penalty notices. I'm pleased that they're low because it means generally there's high levels of compliance. Um, but nonetheless, I'd like to hope... It's still a bit unclear, as to be sure, what, where that revenue does go. Uh, I appreciate it covers administrative costs, but if there is surplus, uh, I'm not sure where that money lies and which budget line it might lie. If there is any surplus, I'd like to think it did go towards improving the quality of our roads uh, in Scotland. So perhaps that's something uh, that... That it can be discussed at a future point, but given the uh, the comments, uh, I'm unlikely to move at 3:20. I think I've made the point suitably. Uh, Amendment 3:25, I think, is a, a different issue. Um, I've had a lot of communication, dealt with a lot of casework around uh, roadworks. I think we all suffer from the bane of roadworks in our respective areas. Um, I think where major roadworks are delayed, and I appreciate that my amendment only talks about the process by which they go through approval for delay, actually in section subsection 2b talks about the delay to the start of works. I think actually, in, in fairness to, to my, my, my team, uh, that should probably have a 2c in there, which also talks about the delay to the completion of works. Because I think that delay to the start is less of an issue. I think where there is an issue is where there's a, uh, 
a large delay to the completion of roadworks or an unannounced delay to the completion of roadworks. Uh, there are many streets where you think the road is going to be closed for four weeks, but for whatever reason, the contractor or the undertaker has decided that this will take much longer, causing huge inconvenience. What process they go through to get permission to delay that completion mm -hmm. is not entirely clear to the public, uh, and indeed, um, whether or not, uh, unless it's for a public safety reason, that uh, the delay, if it's not deemed to be for an appropriate reason, i.e. it's for some cost-saving benefit, or because they're under-resourced or under-financed to complete the work, the Commissioner or the Roadworks Authority could say, no, you must get that work completed within the timescale of what was originally proposed. That's what I would like to see. So I still think this is an issue. I appreciate there is a, a code of conduct, a code of practice around this. I, I, I'd be mindful to go away from this committee session and look at that and see how strong it is. But it certainly is an issue that undertakers do uh, e uh, elongate uh, uh, works um, and that's what the premise of this amendment was seeking to achieve, albeit uh, if it's been poorly drafted. I appreciate uh, we've had a lot of amendments to work on in this bill. So um, I hope the Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and the team will take on board the concerns that have been raised um, uh, through my amendments. Thank you, Convener. No other comments. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you require to wind up? Oh, sorry. Entirely right, Stuart. I I completely overlooked you, for which I'm sorry. Stuart, you wanted to make a comment. Uh, just a couple of brief comments. On 3.20, um, I reiterate my previous opposition to hypothecation of uh, uh, penalties and fines to particular purposes. They should go to the Consolidated Fund, and the Consolidated Fund should provide funding to purposes that serve a public good, quite independent of the origins of, of the money. Now, it creates a perverse incentive uh, to collect penalties and fines if you create a body that depends upon them. Uh, and furthermore, success uh, through penalties and fines causes a reduction uh, in the income of the body concerned. So I think hypothecation, I've said it before, that's it. Uh, 325, I think, I don't know what undertaker uh, means. I think it means statutory undertaker rather than undertaker. Uh, but even there, there are difficulties because not all the people who uh, do roadworks are actually undertakers. An example of something that is not a statutory undertaker would be the provision of district heating pipes because district heating is not covered by statutory undertaker uh, provision. So I think in drafting terms, it's not supportable as it currently stands. Convener. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um you shaking your head, still good. Uh, the question, therefore, that we come to is Amendment 164 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that Section 61 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore want to call Amendment 320 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 164. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Section 62 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 165 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 164. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 165 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that Sections 63 and 64 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 166 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 164. Cabinet Secretary to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 166 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are agreed. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Section 65 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 325 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 164. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Section 66 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question, therefore, is that Sections 67 and 68 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We're now moving on to regional transport partnerships, <laughs> membership and finance. I'd like to call Amendment... 255 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendment 167. Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 255 and speak to both amendments in the group. Jamie. Uh, Jeremy. God, I'm, it's catching. <laughs> uh, thank you, Camilla. Um, the role of regional transport partnerships is to strengthen the planning and delivery of regional transport developments 
so that it is better served the needs of people and businesses. In order to ensure that a regional transport strategy is fully accessible and inclusive, it is important to have the insight and expertise of disabled people who fully understand the lived experience of disability. This amendment would ensure, hopefully, already good practice is happening, but within statutes, that regional transport partnership membership is included a minimum of two disabled people on it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 167? Mira, Amendment 255 is, uh, I accept, I uh, understand the aim of it, and I want to thank Jeremy Balfour for bringing it forward. However, the duty that this amendment seeks to impose would represent a significant practical challenge for RTPs. In addition, work is underway through the National Transport Strategy Review on a refresh of governance models for transport at a regional level. This has the potential to refresh and update regional transport governance, so I do not think now is the right time for this amendment. From a practical perspective, I am not persuaded that imposing a duty on Scottish ministers and RTPs to meet a quota of members with a disability is likely to be an effective way of ensuring that the interests and concerns of disabled people are represented. The committee might be aware there is other work underway as part of the review of the National Transport Strategy, which, will which we will consult on in a number of ways to improve transport governance, which may in itself require further legislative change. I do agree, however, it is necessary for the needs and views of disabled people to be represented in decision-making on transport. That is why, in delivering Scotland's accessible, transport, tra accessible travel framework, we have the Accessibility Travel Steering Group on RTPs, uh, and they are represented alongside disabled groups and disabled individuals. The work of the strategic group is closely aligned to the work of the 15 public appointees who make up the Mobility and Access Committee half of which are disabled people. This governance design enables the full spectrum of disabilities to be considered in delivering improvements. Engagement and participation is one of the key themes identified in the framework with a focus on co-production of transport policies and practice and sharing and learning from the experiences of disabled people. And in my view, the actions being undertaken under the plan are a more effective means of securing the involvement of disabled people in transport planning and governance. And it's for these reasons, it's my view that this amendment is not necessary or appropriate, but I would be happy to ask my officials to engage with Mr Balfour and relevant stakeholders with a view to explaining in more detail the additional steps we are already taking to support the framework and secure the delivery of the actions and improvements that it identifies. I would therefore ask uh, Mr Balfour not to press his amendment, but if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to vote against it. Convener, the bill has introduced makes changes to the way in which RTPs are financed. These changes, along with other things, permit RTPs to carry forward a surplus or a deficit. Amendment 167, in my name, is a technical provision which seeks to ensure that any deficit that is carried forward from part of the expenses or form part of the expenses of an RTP for the year following uh, the year in which they, they were occurred. Uh, this will uh, require partnerships to take any deficit into account when setting an annual budget and ensure that a carryover deficit forms part of the expenses which require to be met by constituent councils. The local authority members of the RTPs will be able to exert control to require the RTP to utilise those reserve funds to meet the deficit when it considers appropriate to do so. Amendment 167 puts in place a necessary additional safeguard against the possibility of RTPs building up significant deficits, and I invite the committee to agree these amendments. Thank, thank you very much. Um, no other members indicated they wish to speak in this uh, debate. So, Jeremy Balfour, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Um, thank you, Convener. I, I mean, I do hear what the, the Minister says, but I, the RTPs do have a really important role to play, and I think we all agree on that. And I do think we have been waiting a long time within the disability community to see better representation. I think it would be fair to say that of all the protected characteristics, the disability community feel it left behind in regard to this. And we have taken steps in other ways to, I think, positively promote other characteristics. And I do think this now has to happen with disability. So I do hear what the Cabinet Secretary says, but I still think there needs to be two members, at least two disabled people, who have lived experience, who can bring this expertise to this uh, partnership. And so I will be uh, pressing the amendment, Camilla. Thank you, 
very much. Uh, and therefore, the question is at this stage that Amendment 255 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are six votes against, there's one abstention, therefore Amendment 255 is not agreed. I'd like to call Amendment 326 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, group with Amendment 327, Rachel Hamilton, to move Amendment 326 and speak to both amendments in the group. Moved. Uh, thank you, convener, and thank you for, uh, to the committee for allowing me to speak to these amendments. Amendment 326 would ensure that community benefit is taken into account by health boards or health care and social partnerships when tendering for non-emergency patient transport contracts. The definition used for community benefits comes from the Procurement Reform Act, and before entering into a contract for the provision of non-emergency patient transport services, each health board, or as it may be, health and social care partnership, must have regard to the extent to which the contract will improve the economic, social, or environmental well-being of the board's area. Community transport operators are well placed to help those in hospital return scenarios, for example. Indeed, the Chief Executive of the British Red Cross said in a 2018 report in and out of hospital that home assessments carried out by transport operators as patients return home can reduce readmission rates. Checking patients take the medication, checking the heating's on and making sure there's food in the house will help the patient to feel more comfortable and allow them to continue the recovery. These are all tasks that community transport operators already carry out with their passengers and would bring community benefit to the area in the form of better outcomes for patients and saving health boards money because of fewer readmissions. If I may, I would like to provide a little bit more background to this amendment. Cuts to bus services not only affect rural communities where older people often struggle to get to their local hospital, but also affect those in urban areas. A community transport association survey recently said, and I quote, our survey said that people aged 65 and over found that almost a quarter felt there was no form of public transport which could get them or a loved one to their hospital appointments on time. This also, of course, contributes to missed appointments, which in the borders, uh, for uh, an example of my own constituency, in 2016 cost £1 million. Moreover, £15 million has been spent on taxis over the past three years, proving that demand for patient transport services is outstripping demand. If I could move on to um, Amendment uh, 327. This amendment uh, intends to compel health boards to work with community transport operators, and both amendments, I feel, are entirely reasonable. With the two amendments, I've placed the duty on the health boards or in or in the case maybe the health and social care partnerships. The amendment requires each board or partnership to work with community transport bodies when providing non-emergency patient transport. It also places a duty on those boards or partnerships to report on how they have co um, complied uh, with that duty. This provides significant opportunities for the local area and can incorporate existing services. The de definition of community transport services links to the definition in the Transport Act 1985 of community bus services, but with modifications for services provided that are not necessarily buses. These amendments are about ensuring we have more appropriate community transport that delivers for passengers, tackles the issues faced in rural areas and takes into consideration community benefit, which delivers better outcome for passengers, for IJBs and the local NHS boards. I urge the committee to support my amendments and I have moved them, but I move them in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin, followed by Stuart. Thanks, Kevin. Amendments 326 and 327 by Rachel Hamilton looked to, to strengthen the relationship between health boards and community transport, and that's something that I very much uh, welcome. In recent years, we've seen the role of government um, in supporting community transport being eroded. I know the previous Labour Lib Dem Scottish Executive used to provide direct support to community transport through the, uh, the Rural Community Transport Initiative. Um, this has obviously been discontinued, and um, the funds that, that were previously ring-fenced at local government level um, are no longer ring-fenced at a time of, of major cuts to council budgets. What this has meant is the amount of support from local councils to community transport um, being reduced and, and at the moment um, government support for community transport consists mainly of a pretty small level of funding for the Community Transport Association but community transport is uh, playing I think a wider role 
um, and should be encouraged to play a, a wider role. It's heavily involved, uh, certainly in my area, in, in patient transport recently, um, but it doesn't get funding from the health board or from the health and social care partnership, uh, and that can often make it unviable. Um, I've seen that recently in my own area where Annandale and Estill Community Transport uh, is about to fold because of a lack of funding, um, and that will actually increase costs on the local NHS, um, who will have to potentially pick up the patient transport that will be lost as a result of that that, that community transport initiative uh, folding. So I, I very much welcome these amendments because I think it focuses our mind on the important role of community transport, uh, the partnership that should be developed with the NHS and their health boards, uh, and I think the transport mode is an opportunity to enhance and support that, <coughs> that partnership. So I'm very supportive of these amendments. Thank you. Stuart. Um, I've, I've got a number of technical issues with uh, what's in front of us. Um, my main one across both the amendments is it doesn't seem to cover um, travel between one health uh, board area to another. An example might be, for example, Forest, which is the, the extreme west side of um, Grampian health board's area. People uh, would possibly go to Inverness rather than to Aberdeen if Dr Gray's, that's the nearest hospital, is not going to provide. So that when it says the well-being of the board's area in 326, I think that's too restrictive. And similarly in 3271, again, it talks about area. Yes, he will. The member taking intervention at that point. Would it, would it not agree, though, that the, wealth, the, the, the term boards area, there are arrangements between boards that, are, that, 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 that deals with. And, and I very much welcome that. Uh, Mr Finney is, of course, correct, which is precisely why people in Forest might well go to Inverness. It is a result of the arrangement. I'm only narrowly looking at uh, the duty that's seeking to be placed here. It's, is, is more restrictive than if you want to achieve the public policy that I think is sought. Uh, than the words uh, here. Um, I, I also, I don't want to take too much time, I've also got a wee uh, issue with, uh, in 327, at 3B2, um, cost effective, I think is, is in tension uh, with the economic, social and environmental well-being. Uh, I wouldn't uh, wish to deny uh, the opportunity to use community transport bodies even if in an individual instance it might be more expensive to do so because of the broader benefits that are being described in 326. So I think there's a bit of work uh, to do uh, on drafting. I strongly support community partnership. In my uh, constituency, there are three uh, community partnerships uh, operate in the area and I, I wish to support them very strongly. I'm just not entirely clear that this is as good a way of doing so as we might see. Uh, John, you'd indicated you wished to speak. Okay, yes, I mean, okay. it is to speak in support of these amendments and say that this is about economy of effort. This is about people working together. And certainly, as others have said, I don't think anyone dissents from the tremendous work that takes place. Much uh, so, uh, this perhaps puts it on, on a firmer footing. If there are any specific issues around the, the wording, I hope that wouldn't uh, uh, dissuade people to support, um, bec because it's the principle I would have thought that uh, our communities want this level of engagement between these uh, two different bodies. Thank you. John, uh, Mike Rumbles, Mike. I'm glad to congratulate Rachel Hubbles for bringing forward these amendments. I think they're really important. Um, and I think it's important to get them, as I say, on the face of the bill in stage two. There are, I'm, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will criticise them, uh, as is his duty and right, where he thinks there's a, a technical problem with them. But that's the whole point about the stage two and the stage three process. Get these on, on the face of the bill and work with the Minister at stage three to address any of the issues that I'm sure he's about to raise. Jamie Green. I, I concur wholeheartedly with Mr Rumbles. Um, it's just a shame that we haven't taken that approach for some of the other amendments. Um, but I think we always have that difficult balance at stage two, so whether we push something to a vote or hope to bring it back or actually get it on the face of the bill with, in the knowledge that there may be technical, technical issues. I think members have expressed uh, broad support for the concept of what Rachel Hamlin is trying to achieve I also support that, and I think if there are ways we can tidy it up, I'm sure that's not beyond the wit man to, with the legislative team to do that. Thank you, Jimmy Green. Cabinet Secretary, you can be brief. Uh, convener, the members in this group are concerned with duties on health boards, and I'm conscious that the committee has not given consideration to uh, the idea of conferring additional powers uh, on health boards under this bill. 
Amendment uh, 326 would place a duty on health boards seeking to enter into a contract for the provision of non-emergency patient transport services to consider the extent to which the contract would, in addition to its main purpose, improve economic, social or environmental well-being in their area. Whilst the amendment does not expressly state how these would be demonstrated, it is possible that health boards would consider producing a report or assessment outlining this uh, has, uh, would have to be undertaken, uh, which may be difficult for them to do. I am aware of the importance of ensuring transport provision, both public uh, transport and community transport, dovetails with the healthcare services to ensure that patients can travel to appointments without hindrance. Arrangements will be carried out in different ways across, every, uh, uh, across the country every day. Amendment 326 seems to assume that it is done by... No, I want to finish what I've got to say before any other points, uh, given time. Clarify, uh, Rachel, you will get a chance to sum up at the end, so you, you may be able to make your point then. Amendment uh, 236 it seems to assume that it is done by way of formal contracts in a uniform manner yet there will be a wide variation in provision. For patients with an explicit clinical need, direct support will be available from the patient transport service of the Scottish Ambulance Service. Where that criteria, criteria is not met, patients without means of transport will be signposted to existing local voluntary and charitable organisations that provide such a service. It may be that a taxi is the only means of transportation, in that event, it may be possible for the patient to reclaim costs for the taxi. Given these variations in approach, the amendment seems to be misguided in how it approaches this issue. As it is unclear how any contract health boards may have in place on the narrow issue of patient transport could be demonstrated to improve such broad outcomes as economic, social or environmental well-being across a geographical area. These additional considerations would constrain health boards' ability to focus these arrangements on the effective and efficient provision of patient transport. Therefore, it may become an onerous and bureaucratic undertaking for health boards with questions as to how it would actually help provision on the ground. On Amendment two, sorry, 327, I acknowledge the important role that community transport bodies may have uh, in the provision of transport to hospitals and other healthcare pre premises. We know that health boards can and do engage with community transport providers on a regular basis. However, placing a statutory duty on health boards to work with these providers in the, provisions of, in the provision of non-emergency patient transport services raises a number of significant issues. Firstly, this runs counter to the whole ethos of the Scottish Government's approach not to micromanage health boards and to allow them discretion when it comes to operational delivery of services in their area. Secondly, community transport services may be provided under contracts to the extent that the intention or indeed the practical effect of this amendment could be to confer an advantage on community transport providers in any process for awarding such contracts, it may give rise to a breach of procurement rules. Finally, the amendment would oblige health boards to publish a report every year on how effective non-emergency patient transport services in their area have been, including some financial assessment of cost effectiveness and a statement of any further actions the board plan to take on such services. Again, a binding national duty to undertake specific actions in such an area could create undue administrative burdens on health boards. Some issues, such as an assessment of cost effectiveness, could be challenging to demonstrate. Indeed, the amendment does not define cost effectiveness uh, and in this form could lead to ambiguity. Additionally, it is not clear what published what, published, uh, what publishing a report in regard to these matters would actually benefit the kind of transport that patients are seeking to be provided with. For these reasons, I cannot support Amendment 326 and 327. However, I do sympathise with Ms Hamilton's sentiments here. It has been an issue which has been raised through our engagement as we shape the national transport strategy. It is an issue that also straddles ministerial portfolios and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport has an interest in this matter. Therefore, I would be happy for the Government to engage with Ms Hamilton prior to Stage 3 to consider these matters in further detail in order to explore where there are further measures that could be taken forward. As such, I would ask Rachel Hamilton not to press Amendment 326 and 327 
but if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to vote against them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Rachel <coughs> Hamilton, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I just want to make the point, Cabinet Secretary, that transport doesn't currently dovetail. I was at a social isolation roundtable this week specifically to discuss, discuss social isolation and loneliness in my own constituency. There were community transport uh, providers around the table and one gave an example of uh, a, a transport provider and a community transport uh, service uh, running in parallel, picking up almost neighbours and going to appointments almost at the same time. The current system, Cabinet Secretary, is not working and it is not providing economic benefit. I don't think that the NHS are going to gripe about saving money. They need to look at saving money, but we also need to consider the overall uh, community benefits. And um, the, um, it's all about being patient-centred. And this is not about be being patient-centred. And I would ask that... Um, because I've got support today from uh, members of this committee that I will press this, these, both of these amendments and I would hope that um, I could take up your offer to work even though I um, have had support today if that these amendments are successful. Thank you. So you are pressing oh. your amendment. Well, actually, convener, I think uh, I may not press my amendments. Well, you have to make a decision, I'm not Rachel. Going to press it's the either press or withdraw. Withdraw. Thank you. Right. So, <laughs> Rachel Hamilton wishes to withdraw <laughs> amendment 326. Does any member of the committee wish to object? <laughs> Mr. Rumbles wants to object, <clears throat> therefore we will go straight on to a decision is that the question that amendment 326 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There is a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Too late, Christine, I'm afraid. <laughs> and abstentions? What? No, I'm not running the vote again. It's clear there's an, one abstention. There's five votes for. Sorry, yes, okay. Okay. Um, on Amendment 326, there are five votes for, there are five votes against, there is one abstention, and I've always made it clear as convener, I will, do, I will vote on uh, a division where it is my casting vote in the same way that I did at the outset. Therefore, it means that there are six votes for, five votes against, one abstention, therefore, Amendment 326 is agreed. I call Amendment 327 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 326. Rachel Hamilton, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. Therefore, the question is, Amendment 327 be agreed. Are we all agreed? All. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. And those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. Okay, there are five votes for, there are five votes against. There is one abstention, and therefore... In the same way that I did with the previous vote, I would cast it in the way I did the first time. Therefore, there are six votes for, so Amendment, three, three, Amendment 327 is agreed. I call Amendment 167 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 255. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 167 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 69 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And we're now moving on to the accessible transport framework and I'm calling amendment 256 in the name of Jeremy Balfour in a group on its own. Jeremy Balfour to move and speak to amendment 256. Uh, convener, the accessible travel framework for Scotland was published in September 2016. The purpose of the framework is to support disabled people's rights by removing barriers and improving access to travel and ensuring disabled people are fully involved in work to improve all aspects of travel. The framework provides a national vision and outcome for accessible travel and was developed by a steering group including organisations of and for disabled people, transport service providers, local government and Transport Scotland. This amendment would require ministers simply to report on an annual basis what action has been taken to promote the accessible transport framework and the outcomes detailed in the framework. The advantage of this is that once uh, a minister reports, 
um, this committee or the parliament itself could at least evaluate is progress being made and if not what should be done to make things move quicker thank you thank you uh jeremy can i uh, there are no other members who've indicated they wish to speak cabinet secretary would you like to say anything Convene Amendment uh, 256 from Jeremy Balfour seeks to impose a duty on named public authorities uh, to have regard to the document going further Scotland's accessible travel framework in carrying out their functions. The amendment would require, uh, also require that Scottish ministers to report annually on the steps they have taken to promote the framework and to ensure the framework is modified within five years of the date on which the bill received royal assent or within five years of the date it was last modified. Allow me to begin by agreeing strongly with the importance of making uh, travel accessible to everyone. Uh, Scottish ministers have made clear their expectation that Scotland's transport providers will continually improve their performance to help disabled people make better journeys. For our part, this government is taking a series of actions to help make that happen, one of which is the work we have done with disabled people's organisations, transport providers, RTPs and local government to co-produce the accessible travel framework. This framework sets out a national vision and outcome for accessible travel and highlights a range of specific actions to be taken with a view to achieving those outcomes. Whilst I can see that the amendment is intended to bring additional impetus to the development of the framework and implementation of the actions it highlights, I do not consider that it would be in practice achieved at these ends. Public authorities and transport authority operators are already bound by various statutory equality duties relating to the accessibility of public transport vehicles and the transport services provided and the exercise of relevant public functions. The framework is not a statutory creation and is not intended to be something which is binding in legal force. Rather, it is intended to be the means through which disabled people and those involved in providing public transport across Scotland can work together in a more collaborative, flexible and responsive way to improve accessibility for all aspects of travel. It's not, clear at, it's not at all clear that imposing the additional statutory duty which requires public authorities to have regard to the framework would, in reality, give the framework any greater status or secure any increase in the pace of its development and implementation. This is especially so given that the amendment uh, does not provide any means by which compliance with the duty is to be demonstrated, measured or enforced. I do recognise that while some improvements have already been made as a result of the framework, there is much to, still to do. However, I can confirm that we are already working with stakeholders to increase the pace of implementing the actions identified in the framework by moving to an annual delivery plan for this and future financial years, agreeing realistic deliverables, maximising delivery and reducing inefficiencies. It should be stressed that these annual delivery plans will be co-produced, like the framework itself, with disabled people. It will also be possible to monitor and measure progress against these plans effectively. In my view, this is a much more appropriate approach to progressing the framework than imposing the additional general duties proposed in the amendment. There is also a number of technical issues with the amendment, which means that its legal effect will be unclear. For example, it is not clear which part of the framework authorities would be obliged to have regard to. It is, the vision, the is it the vision, is it the outcomes, the action plan, uh, or is it, it is unclear what compliance with the uh, failure to comply with the duties uh, would draw in terms of penalties. For all of these reasons, my view is that the amendment is not necessary or appropriate. I would, however, be happy to ask my officials to discuss with Mr Balfour the relevant stake and stakeholders with a view to explain uh, in more detail the additional steps we are already taking to support the framework and to secure delivery of the actions set out within it. I therefore ask Mr Balfour not to press his amendment, but if it is pressed, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Jeremy Balfour, can I ask you to... Uh wind up and press or withdraw your amendment? Um, thank you, Convener. I mean, I think, again, there is um, a fear within uh, some of the uh, third sector, although I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary said this morning, that this accessible transport framework um, over time will gather dust and uh, not see actual any practical changes. I think the main area for me of I miss, and where I think I would disagree with the Cabinet Secretary, is the advantage of this, uh, this amendment 
is that it makes Scottish ministers lay something before Parliament on an annual basis and then allows the Parliament, if they so want, to question the Cabinet Secretary on that. On that point. Yeah. In terms of his concerns about it gathering dust, the Scotland's Accessible Travel Framework, the delivery plan uh, for this year was published yesterday, no, setting I, I, out the actions yeah. that will be taken going forward uh, this year, which dovetails with the annual report that's laid before Parliament by the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. Uh, no, no, I do, I, do, I do appreciate that, Cabinet Secretary. I suppose what we're trying to do is future-proof anything um, where other administrations may not be as proactive as you and your officials are being. But as I say, I do think the key for me is, is allowing Parliament to be involved and for there to be scrutiny at, by MSPs going forward around this. Um, and that's why I will press the amendment. Thank you very much. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 256 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. There are four votes for, there are six votes against, there's one abstention, so therefore Amendment 256 is not agreed. The question is that Section 70 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, and this is moving on to the next session, section on accessibility of traffic lights. And I'd like to call Amendment 257 in the name of Jeremy Balfour in a group on its own. Jeremy Balf Balfour, to move and speak to Amendment 257, please. Uh, Convener, this is, uh, you'll be glad to hear the, the last of my amendments uh, for you today, um, and I would like to pay uh, credit uh, to my two daughters uh, who brought this whole issue to my attention um, um, about nine months ago. Uh, when we were crossing the road, they had their uh, finger underneath the button that you press in the traffic light, and I thought they were just being the usual annoying self, and told them to take the hand away for getting dirty, and we said, no, no, there is a, a, a round thing that goes round when it goes to being a green man. And I suspect many of us were unaware office and did not know that this exists. So with this small, unassuming plastic or metal cone, which you can find on the underside of a pedestrian crossing. When the green, green main light turn to green, then it starts to go round. So someone with a visual impairment or someone who is completely blind is able to cross the road by themselves without any assistance from anybody else. It's there for those people who cannot see the lights. And when we feel it, they can then cross the road. The amendment which I'm moving uh, this, this morning places a duty on traffic authorities to ensure that new traffic lights do have this accessible um, thing for people with visual impairments. And also... Way. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the modern tra uh, pedestrian crossings do not have the light across the road, but they actually have it beside where per somebody stands. Does that partly solve the problem, or would you still need that as well? If you're completely blind, that it it, whoever it is, it doesn't solve the issue, and that can be there um, as well. The amendment also requires that each authority to report annually to ministers, um, and again, for this to be laid before Parliament. The reason for that is, um, slightly ironically, uh, here again, the headquarters of the RNIB, uh, the traffic lights where you cross to get to their offices, uh, this device has been broken for the last 12 months. Um, and although I've written to Edinburgh City Council on one or two occasions asking for it to be fixed, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been mended. So there is a danger that we're, um, we're put in, but not maintained. Uh, certainly, Mr Finney. For Mr. Balfour taking intervention. It's a very common feature of a lot of legislation, both in this committee and elsewhere, to want reports to come to Parliament uh, on an annual or, or other determined basis. Is there not a concern that these just become an administrative process and gather dust? I'm absolutely with them on the issue of having properly functioning and completely accessible infrastructure, but this does seem to pose a, an onerous um, a administrative burden that indeed I, I thought his party was against. Uh, well, on the presumption that so far each amendment has failed, um, there's no extra reports coming uh, thanks to my amendments. Um, I do accept his point, but on the other hand, I do think there has to be a way, particularly for the third sector, to be able to influence what is going on. And I think if you lay a report before Parliament, they can then come to MSPs if it is appropriate and say, can you raise these questions? And MSPs have that duty. If that doesn't happen, I do think the danger is that we 
put in all these accessible traffic lights, but they're not maintained properly by local authorities. So I, I, I am against um, any extra work that takes away from the day-to-day -day providing, but I do think there needs to be an accountability here, which I think this amendment does give, and it does allow people who've got visual impairment, rather than having to wait... For Absolutely. Um, my understanding is that almost all traffic lights also have an audio uh, alert as well as a, a visual alert. And actually, sometimes it's turned off, but it can be turned back on underneath the bit that you press. So don't most traffic lights have audio as well, which help those with an impairment? Um, we do, but again, on busy streets, um, and some of the streets here in Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, other for me, it's, if you actually try to hear it, it's very difficult to hear. And, and again, a number of people have said to me, they sim if it's a very busy day with lots of traffic on the road, then that is not being heard. And for people with visual impairment, this is what they think gives them the best um, ability to be able to go out and cross roads. The technology is there, it's available, we're simply asking for it to be implemented, which I think should be good practice um, for disabled people. Um, I rest for Th thank you, Jeremy. No other members indicated they wish to speak, so Cabinet Secretary. Convener, Amendment 257 from Jeremy Balfour seeks to impose a duty on traffic authorities to ensure that new traffic lights erected in their area are accessible for persons with a disability. It would also require those authorities to provide annual reports to Scottish ministers, setting out what they have done to comply with that duty and what steps they have taken to, uh, to, existing crossing, uh, to make existing crossings accessible. Uh, Scottish ministers would be obliged to lay a summary of these reports before the Scottish Parliament each year. Whilst I completely agree with the principle of having pedestrian crossings that are accessible and uh, straightforward to use for everyone, I do not, con do not consider that these amendments are necessary or appropriate. Traffic authorities are given powers to provide pedestrian crossings on roads for which they are responsible for provision made in the traffic, Road Traffic Regulations Act 1984. The 1984 Act also provides that the traffic signs used to indicate a pedestrian crossing must comply with the specifications set out in regulations under the Act. Currently, the traffic sign regulations and general directions 2016. In making a decision as to the location and type of crossings to be created, traffic authorities are guided by a design manual such as the local transport notes 2-95. This document is currently being reviewed by the Department for Transport with input from Scottish ministers and local traffic, traffic authorities uh, and is expected to include updated guidance and on, issue, on issues of accessibility, including on the very issue of the rotating cone that Mr Balfour made reference to. Additional guidance for traffic authorities is provided in the Roads for All Good Practice Guide produced by Transport Scotland. This document also includes advice on the accessibility of pedestrian crossings. Transport Scotland is currently reviewing and updating this guidance document in consultation with relevant stakeholders. In addition, Transport Scotland chairs the Roads for All Forum, which meets quarterly and includes representatives from the Mobility Access Committee for Scotland, Guide Dogs at Scotland, RNIB, Living Streets, Alzheimer's Scotland and the Scottish Accessible Transport Alliance and the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland, Disability Equality Scotland and other organisations representing people with a disability. The main function of this forum is to advise Transport Scotland on the interests of disabled people in connection with the development of standards for the design, construction and maintenance of roads and for the layout and accessibility of public transport infrastructure, including pedestrian crossings. This ensures that Scottish ministers are well informed on the accessibility issues and can update the regulations, design manuals and best practice guides in this area. I can confirm that the members of the forum are involved in the update of the Roads for All Good Practice Guide uh, that I mentioned a moment ago. I should also, uh, should also be noted that in exercising their functions in connection with pedestrian crossings, traffic authorities are already subject to the duty to make reasonable adjustments for people with a disability and the general public sector equality duty set out in the Equality Act 2010. These duties can be measured and enforced 
using the machinery provided within the 2010 Act. For all these reasons, I do not consider that the amendment is necessary. It should also be noted that the reports required by subsection 3 of the amendment would place additional administrative and financial burden on traffic authorities and there has been no consultation with them or stakeholders about the duties which this would impose on them through this amendment. For all, of the, uh, re all of these reasons, my view is that the existing arrangements are ones which can be made to work effectively, and I would therefore ask Jeremy Balfour not to press his amendment. If so, I would ask the committee to reject it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jer Jeremy Balfour, you uh, get the opportunity to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Uh, just uh, very briefly, convener, I think um, the, the, the simple answer is that in some parts um, of Scotland, this is not working, and so I move the amendment. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 257 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. Mike, your hand is hardly moving sometimes. It's good to see it. Uh, four votes for, six votes against, one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 257 is not agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 321 in the name of John Finney, grouped with Amendments 322, 323 and 324. John Finney, can I ask you to move Amendment 321 and speak to the amendments in the group? John. Um, thank you, Convener. The amendments in this group um, in my name are the result of my working with councillors uh, at Edinburgh Council, and they seek to alter procedural requirements regarding roads and traffic regulation orders. I'll speak briefly to each one of them, if I may, Convener, please. On Amendment 321, uh, it would remove the requirement for local authorities to refer any objections to a, an RSO, a Road Scotland uh, order, to ministers. The current process of requiring referral adds considerable time and expense to the provision of active travel infrastructure by our local authorities. Redetermination orders are currently required for conversion of carriageway to footway or cycleway, footway to cycleway, etc. And under the current law, even the most minor changes to the extent of footways, for example, a minor curb uh, build-outs to help pedestrians cross a road, it should be subject to a redetermination order. Object objections to even minor changes require referral to Scottish ministers. This involves a risk that a public hearing will be called and the consideration process, even without a hearing, can be lengthy. Anecdotal evidence suggests many local authorities do not use these orders, but the current legislation and local authorities' legal advice is quite clear that they are required. This amendment is intended to speed up the redetermination process and grant local authorities the power to determine objections to a redetermination order. This change has the potential to remove between 9 and 18 months worth of delay to a scheme. This is important as the drawn out nature of delivery of a scheme is a source of great frustration to many local communities. The current need to refer all objections to ministers regardless of the scale of project or the number or nature of objections also shows a lack of proportionality. The additional time and resource required to manage the RSO process acts both as a deterrent to local authorities from pursuing schemes uh, and detracts from their ability to deliver projects in a timely fashion. This amendment moves the requirement which stipulates that unresolved objections to a redetermination order must be decided by Scottish ministers. This would grant local authorities the power to decide on objections to a redetermination order, avoiding significant delay and encouraging the delivery of more schemes enabling active travel. Um, and this change indeed would enable local authorities to make a more nuanced approach when considering the appropriate recourse to objections to redetermination orders. The ability to reduce, reduce delays enables local authorities to, deliver, to better deliver on commitments with the reduced administration burning, enabling resources to be deployed uh, where most needing. Uh, turning to Amendment uh, 322, Convener, um, it follows on from Amendment 321. Um, um, 321 deals with the primary legislation and this one addresses the secondary legislation, and as such, I'll keep my comments uh, brief. Um, this amendment alters the procedure for dealing with RSO objections. It removes the requirement to prepare documents and submit them to Scottish ministers. Current, currently, these documents provide the basis for ministers' decisions regarding if a public hearing is required. Changing this regulatory procedure in combination with Amendment 321 results in the re removal of the need for any objection to a redetermination order to be submitted to Scottish Minister for consideration, along with the preparation of associated paperwork. This amendment 
is required in combination with Amendment 3 to 1 to streamline the RSO process. The reasons that this is important and members should therefore vote for it are the same as those stated at 3 to 1. Amendment 3 to 3, 2, 3 would remove the automatic triggering of a Scottish Government-led public hearing when an objection is received to an alteration to loading provision on the carriageway out with peak hours. The legislation, as it currently exists, is excessively stringent. There is a requirement for a mandatory public hearing with a Scottish Government reporter when there are objections to certain categories of restrictions that can be proposed under TROs, notably a loading ban operating out with peak times, regardless of the length of care line affected. The final decision for all other comparable traffic regulation charges lies, changes a bigger pardon, lies with the local authority. So this process is inconsistent with that. Mandatory public hearings can significantly delay the implementation of active travel as well as other projects and the resulting drawn-out nature of delivery of screams also, as I said previously, presents a, a source of frustration to communities impacted by the scheme. The prospect of needing to go through additional time and resource required to manage the TRO process also acts as a deterrent to Council's progressing projects that involve reallocation of road space. It also detracts from their ability to deliver projects in a timely fashion. Uh, this change to legislation has the potential, as the uh, previous amendment does, to, to remove nine to 18 months of delay on the delivery of project. <coughs> and it begins uh, again, would be proportional. Um, and the ability to reduce delays in delivering active travel schemes would need to councils to support Scottish Government in their commitment to deliver a healthier, more active Scotland. One final um, amendment. Um, can we run that's 324. Um, and it increases the duration for which an experimental TRO can be kept in place and providing a mechanism for converting experimental TROs to permanent orders. Experimental orders exist so that local authorities can test changes to road layouts to better understand the effects before making the changes permanent. However, experimental orders can only run for 18 months, which often doesn't provide sufficient time to both assess the impact of the change or complete the legal process to make a permanent order. The 18-month timescale means that the process of making a permanent TRO must begin very shortly after the experimental TRO is in place to avoid a gap between the experimental TRO ending and the permanent TRO coming into place. If a permanent TRO is not in place when the 18-month period expires, local authorities must go through the costly exercise of removing the changes implemented under the experimental order even if these changes are beneficial. Experimental TROs therefore currently fail to offer sufficient opportunity for local authorities to make informed decisions based on a proper analysis of the impact of changes before making more permanent alterations, particularly in relation to more complex and contentious projects for which experiments often uh, are of most value. By extending the potential duration of experimental TROs and streamlining the process to convert them into permanent TROs, this amendment would enable local authorities to use experimental TROs more effectively. In particular, it would help ensure that the impacts of a scheme are properly understood before any decision to make the order permanent is, is taken, significantly reduce the, the, the risk of schemes that are working effectively having to be removed because a permanent order cannot be delivered in time. My amendment also allows for Scottish Government, if by bigger pardon, uh, Scottish Ministers to introduce a specific procedure enabling local authorities to convert an experimental TRO into a permanent TRO. At present, there is no procedure for this and local authorities must go through the full existing TRO process to make any changes permanent. And I move amendment 321 in my name, Katrina. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Mr Finney. Uh, Colin, you've indicated you want to say something. Yeah, thanks very much, I mean, we've seen in, uh, in recent uh, weeks um, that, that progress in the number of journeys being carried out by a bicycle has, has, has been pretty woeful, um, yet we, we can see that the current uh, procedures delay um, projects that promote active travel, uh, in my view, in a quite prohibitive way, um, often for um, quite um, minor reasons. Um, so I very much welcome these amendments from, from John Finney. I mean, they could reduce timescales by up to 18 months uh, in some cases. I mean, it's important that objectors um, have a fair hearing, uh, but I think that needs to be proportionate. 
and it's quite clear that the current procedures um, are not proportionate. I think we need to see some real changes when it comes to better promoting active travel and the projects that, that support that. And I think these amendments are the type of practical change that can be made that, that will make a, a difference. So I'm very happy to support these, uh, these amendments. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Jamie, did you want to speak? Um... Just very briefly, and I thank Mr Finney for his explanation. These are largely technical amendments, um, so they weren't entirely obvious from day one what they were seeking to achieve. I mean, I, I, I do have some concerns over the fact that we are amending other pieces of primary and secondary regulation. Uh, I would say in a, in a fairly major way, perhaps for the right reasons, as, as Mr Finney alludes to, but we haven't really had a, a huge amount of opportunity to, as a committee, debate what these changes or the consequences of them are, because they may have a, an outcome which these changes will allow uh, certain things to happen in a different way to how they currently happen. But it, as is always with the case of legislation, if you change something, there are always consequences. So I don't think we've had... F uh, yeah, in a second, yeah, I just, I just don't feel we've had the opportunity to fully consider every potential implication of making these changes, either to the positive or to the negative, especially in, uh, hearing from the local authorities to which these changes will affect the most, and that's something we just simply haven't had the opportunity to hear. And that's not a criticism of the members' amendment, it's just of the process by which we've gone through. Happy to take an intervention. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention, and I certainly understand what he said. Um, would the member accept that the arrangements that these amendments seek to change are out of kilter with other arrangements? No one's trying to frustrate, I'd be the last person to frustrate, the right of a citizen to object, but it is a weighty administrative process that presently exists that is frustrating the progress on a number of schemes. Yeah, I mean, look, if, 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 if the member thinks that the process currently is not working and this is a way to achieve that, then is, is entitled to do so. I'm... I think on this one I'm very keen to be open-minded enough to listen to the Cabinet Secretary who has, a, as you can see, a, a wealth of experience around him and behind him to, to tell me whether or not the, the current system does give adequate protection to those who object or not, or if indeed he thinks that these are necessary. Um, I, I give great um, uh, credence to the views of uh, legal experts in that respect. So, you know, I think I'll listen to the debate as it progresses. but. Uh, on, my, my instinct is, is, is not to, 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 to um, agree with what's in front of us unless we can be persuade a strong argument as to why it's needed. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think that is now you. Your turn. Convener, Amendment 321 and 322 attempts to simplify the order-making process for redetermining the means by which the public right of passage over the road may be exercised. Currently, road authorities must adhere to the procedure set out in the stopping up of roads and private accesses and the redetermination of public rights of passage procedures, Scotland Regulations 1986. These regulations include a process for remitting proposals to Scottish ministers if objections are made to those proposals by members of the public eh, and are not withdrawn, thereby providing an opportunity for an independent review of the proposals. Amendment 321 seeks to enable new procedural regulations to be made in respect of redetermination orders, placing the provision made for these orders in the, 1980, the 1986 regulations. No provision is made for the new regulations to require the involvement of the Scottish Ministers when objections to the proposed order are received. Instead, the amendment simply provides that the authority should be obliged to consider the objections before they can make the order. Amendment 322 follows on from Amendment 321 by amending the 1986 regulations, removing the current process for the remittance to Scottish ministers and requiring instead that the Roads Authority must consider any objections themselves. This may amount in practice to the Roads Authority rubber stamping their own decision, which could in turn potentially lead to an increase in judicial review proceedings in respect of these orders. It should also be noted that the change proposed by Amendment 322 would also extend to the other orders to which the 1986 regulations apply, including orders permanently stopping up roads and preventing dangerous accesses from 
public roads to land. It is unclear if the amendment is intended to have such an extensive application. Amendment 321 and 322 would therefore remove a significant part of the process currently attached to these orders. Any adjustment to that process would require careful consideration of the balances between the needs of road users and the maintenance of a robust and fair procedure for consideration of public objections. And I'm not persuaded that these amendments strike that balance. Amendment 323 seeks to amend the Local Authorities Traffic Order Procedures Scotland Regulations 1999, which set out the procedure to be followed by local traffic authorities to make traffic regulation orders. The effect of the amendment would be to remove the obligation on such an authority to hold a hearing where they propose to make an order prohibiting loading or unloading to which an objection has been made and not withdrawn. In such cases, the authority would still have the power to hold a hearing before making the order, but they would no longer be obliged to do so. The authority could therefore decide, after considering the objections received, to make the order without any further procedure. This would be, this would be a, a, no effective recourse, there would be no effective recourse for local people or businesses who may be adversely affected by such a decision as the Road Traffic Regulations Act 1984 appears to prevent any challenge to the, valid, the valid, validity of orders made within the powers conferred by that Act and in accordance with the relevant procedural arrangements. Once again, it would be necessary to consider the balance of risk in such a proposal very carefully to ensure the procedure attaching to these orders is fair and is proportionate. Amendment 324 relates to experimental traffic orders. At present, provision made in the Road Traffic Regulation Act 1984 allows these orders to be made for a period not exceeding 18 months. The effect of Mr Finney's amendment would be to allow local traffic authorities to extend the experimental order for a further period of 18 months or potentially an indefinite period as is required in order to enable the authority to evaluate the benefits and to complete the process of making it permanent. These orders are, by their very nature, intended to be temporary. Further, it is already possible to make the effect of experimental orders permanent by promoting a permanent traffic regulation order. And the procedural requirements relating to permanent orders are already set out in regulations. I'm therefore not persuaded that Amendment 324 is necessary. For all of the reasons uh, that I've set out, I presently cannot support the changes of the kind viewed in Amendments 321 and 324. I do, however, have some support for the principle of what John Finney's amendment seeks to do in terms of clarifying and streamlining the procedure for making redetermination orders and experimental traffic orders. However, careful consideration must be given to changing legislative procedures that provide people the rights to appeal a road scheme, which they consider to have safety, which they consider may have safety implications for road users or impact on the local economy. We've already made clear our commitment to review the traffic regulation order process outside the bill framework, and I consider that a similar approach needs to be undertaken on the redetermination order process. I therefore ask my officials to take consideration of this issue forward in the context of the Active Travel Task Force Delivery Plan, which will be published shortly. I would be happy to work with John Finney on the TRO process review and invite him to work with us to get to the core of the issues and to identify solutions that strike the correct balance between road user safety and maintaining a robust and fair process for considering objections. I therefore ask John Finney not to press Amendment 321 uh, to 324, but if they are pressed, I would ask the committee to reject them. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. John Finney, I could ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendments, please. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Can, can I thank those who have participated in the debate, and particularly um, um, Colin Smith for his, uh, his, his support? As the, the, the Cabinet Secretary said, this was and is about simplifying a process, and uh, it certainly is the case that a local authority would be obliged to consider uh, objections. Um, 
<clears throat> these have passed, the, you know, and there are different legal views, and I again accept Mr Dean's position on that. I wouldn't be supportive of a, a rubber stamping exercise that would disenfranchise the citizen from appealing. So most certainly uh, that, that's not what the intention is to, to, to steamroller. If I did, that's a good metaphor. Um, any any um, um, issues through. Um, it is about striking a balance. Absolutely, it is about striking a balance. Uh, and um, it, it's not about preventing challenge. Um, the, 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 I'm, I'm pleased about the Cabinet Secretary's comments about uh, clarity required about issues and, and streamlining the process. And I'm aware, in fact, we're all aware from um, other work that the committee's done of, of some of the ongoing work. And I'd be very happy to engage with the Cabinet Secretary on these issues and, and not press them, uh, convener. Thank okay, you. thank you. Does any member object to... Okay, to yeah, does any member object to uh, John Finney withdrawing amendment uh, 321? No one objects, uh, therefore it is withdrawn. Can I just confirm for clarity on the record that you are also not pressing 322, 323 and 324? Um, yes, indeed. It's not my okay. wish to, to press these. Thank you. So they're not moved? They're not moved. Can Thank you very much. So we move on to the next section, which is on corporate of offending. And I'm going to call Amendment 168 in the name of cap the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary, I move and speak to amendment 168, please. Convener, amendment 168 inserts a technical provision into the bill dealing with cases where an offence created by or under the bill is committed, committed by an organisation such as a company or partnership rather than by an individual. The amendment provides that if, despite the offence having been committed by an organisation, it was committed with the consent or, uh, of the persons uh, of a specified position in the organisation or was attributable to that person's negligence, then both the person and the organisation may be prosecuted for the offence. The people within organi relevant organisations who may be caught by this provision are those with whom some responsibility for the management or control of these organisations. Organisations. This prevents individuals in positions of responsibility within organisations from hiding behind organisational structures to avoid criminal liability. And I therefore move Amendment 168. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, you want to say something briefly, followed by John Finney, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, of course, Jamie that will be as brief as possible, um, given our time constraints this morning. Uh, but I think this is an important issue to raise. If you look at some of the provisions that we're passing, uh, certainly around things like uh, workplace parking levies where there's a, a duty on companies to meet the obligations therein. This changes the rules. This basically says it's not the company, it is actually individual members of the companies. So I think we need to be really quite clear here as to whether the liability falls on companies or whether individuals within a company. If you look at the table that's been provided to us in subsection 3, or at the end of subsection 3, around what is a relevant organisation versus what is an individual. It includes words like manager or secretary. I mean, you could be a manager of people in an organisation but have no direct corporate responsibility for that organisation. By default, in the way that this is drafted, the company could be liable and pass on that liability to an individual that it deems to be appropriately attached to one of the descriptions under individual. I think these are very loose and weak descriptions of individuals within a corporate structure. So if, 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 the, if the current secretary is, is willing to push this, wants to push this, I think he's going to have to tighten up the description of what, uh, how you, you make somebody accountable for an organisation because not every manager or company secretary or officer uh, will have full responsibility for the actions that their company takes. And I do have a concern that, that some of the enforcement actions that we passed or, or that some members passed uh, around uh, provisions in other parts of the Transport Bill will now uh, place uh, a legal duty on individuals within those organisations to fulfil that and indeed any prosecution will be to those individuals, not to the companies that are concerned. So I, I do have concerns about, about this amendment. Thank you, Jamie. John Finney, followed um, by Stuart Stevenson. This is a very well established principle which would only, you'd have to show intent for a crime, crime to, to be committed um, and if there's an actor of omission that merits that combined with content, intent then, then, then so be it. Um, it does also have a, a preventative element to it. Very supportive of this principle. Thank you. Thank you John. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, I, too, very strongly support uh, this particular provision. However, I just want to be slightly clear uh, in uh, 
the table that's provided uh, where it describes the individual in relation to the Companies Act 2006, uh, the alternative member where the company's affairs are managed by its members. I just wonder where and by what means such members are identified. Um, Mike Rumbles, Mike. Yeah, I'm, I think if we have something like the workplace parking, um, then we have to, uh, and we said that the employer is responsible uh, for the charge and if there is a, uh, an offence in that or uh, by not complying with this then we've got to hold companies responsible and it's quite right therefore we have the relevant organisation. I have to say though um, in company law I thought directors were responsible for what the company does and what what the government and the Michael Matheson's 168 does is a manager, secretary or similar officer. A manager is not a director doesn't have to be a director of a company. So I'm, I'm, I'm rather, I, I don't quite understand why you've gone down this route, because I thought directors of companies are responsible for what the company does. Um, maybe the Cabinet Secretary can address that in his winding up, which we've come to now. Um, so the amendment reflects existing uh, law by and large around um, uh, corporate offences in Scotland and has uh, been shaped on that basis. Uh, let me pick up on the very specific point around this idea of workplace parking levies. Workplace parking levies are a civil matter. This is to deal with criminal matters, uh, not civil matters, which is different. So the threshold of requirement for a prosecution in this type of area for uh, matters about corporate offending is uh, significantly higher than a civil matter. It's got to be beyond reasonable doubt rather than uh, on the, the basis of probability. Let me give you an example of where it could be a criminal offence. Uh, it could be a criminal offence for a company to apply for a licence for workplace parking levy, but to specifically to put false information in that licence application, just in the exact same way it is for uh, uh, those who may own a pub. If they give wrong information on a licence application, it is a criminal offence. If the person who fills in that form does so on the basis that they were instructed by one of their managers to actually give false information, then that manager is committing a criminal offence as well. The issue that Jamie Green raised in terms of the potential criminalisation of individuals, let's keep in mind, any provision around corporate offending has to be based on an investigation by the police, a report to the Procurator Fiscal, potentially further reports uh, to be commissioned by the Procurator Fiscal to determine whether an individual uh, or a number of individuals have committed an offence before they even get prosecuted. So there is a number of checks and balances in our criminal justice system that filter through all of this process to determine whether somebody may be prosecuted in the first place. So I think the concerns and anxieties which have been highlighted by Jamie Green by and large are dealt with by the process that we have within our criminal justice system, which is a well-established principle. So, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for winding up. The question that we come to is amendment, is amendment 168 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. <clears throat> so we now move to amendment 169 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 169. I predict this might be your shortest intervention yet. This may be the most anticipated amendment this committee has ever considered uh, convener in the, last, uh, in the last few years. Amendment 168 inserts a technical provision into the bill dealing with the liability of the Crown for offences created by the bill and by any regulations made under it. The provisions in and under the bill include offences by default, uh, bind the Crown. But as a matter of general policy, acts of the Scottish Parliament do not make the Crown liable for criminal offences. Instead, the liability of the Crown in respect of acts constituting offences is enforced through the civil courts. Accordingly, Amendment 169 provides that the Crown may not be held cr criminally liable under any provision in the bill or regulations made under it. Alongside the exemption, let me just finish the point, first of all, Mr Finney. Alongside the exemptions under criminal pr prosecution, this amendment gives the Court of Session a power on the application of the Lord Advocate to declare unlawful an act or omission 
in respect of which the Crown would otherwise be criminally liable. This amendment does not affect the criminal liability of Crown servants who may be prosecuted for offences created by the Bill and regulations under it in the usual way. And I therefore move Amendment 169. And I'll take Mr Finney's point. Yeah. Uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, thank you for taking the interest, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of um, sensitivities around the term the Crown and indeed I secured a, a, an amendment to the Workways Parking that made specific reference. Are you meaning individuals? Are you meaning an estate? And if so, is it appropriate for individuals to have immunity? Yeah, so it's organisation as opposed to individuals. Individuals are still covered. Okay, and if, if a further intervention, do you confirm every individual covered? Uh, who, who would you who would you think we are seeking to exclude? Well, are you, are you excluding to exclude the Windsor family, for instance? <laughs> uh, the provisions in this bill are similar to any other bill that's been passed by the Scottish <laughs> Parliament in relation to provisions for the Crown. Thank you, Mr. Finney. Um, I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm assuming that the Cabinet Secretary has has wound up his uh, thing. So the question that we get to is amendment. 169 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There's a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Those who wish to abstain, please raise their hands. Oh. So, on Amendment 169, we have... I think you, there are nine votes for, there's one vote against and there's one abstention. Therefore, it is agreed. The question is that Section 71 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now, I wish to call amendments 170 to 183 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, all previously debated. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 170 to 183 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 170 to 183? No. Good. Therefore, the question, the question is that amendments 170 to 183 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Sorry. Uh, the question is that... Uh, yeah, what schedule is that? The schedule be agreed. Are we all agreed? I therefore call Amendment 184 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 225. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 184 will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'd now like to call Amendment 29 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 28. Uh, Jamie Green, to move or not move? I'm advised not to move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 252 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 51. Jamie Green to move or not move? I have no idea. Um, not moved. Uh, therefore, I call Amendment 253 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 228. Colin uh, Smith to move or not move? Yeah, not move. Thank you. I, I therefore call Amendment 254 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 229. Uh, Colin Smith to move or not move? Not move. I therefore call Amendment 27 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 15. John Finney to move or not move? Move, Convener. OK, the question is that 27, Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 317 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 316. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 279 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260. Uh, Peter Chapman to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, Amendment 279 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 72 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 280 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 260, Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 280 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. No. We're, we're not agreed. Sorry, who did I miss? I never like to miss you, Mr Rumble. So. <laughs> therefore, I, there is a division. Can I ask those in favour, please, to raise their hands? Those against, please raise their hands, and those who wish to abstain. 
Ah, there are nine votes for, there's one vote against, and there's one abstention. Therefore, Amendment 280 is agreed. The question it now is that the long title be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you very much, everyone. Could I, could I ask committee members uh, to uh, stay in place, but I am going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to depart, and we are going to move into private session.